And I'm all, an error occurred. What? It says we're live. It says live. Live. Hi, everybody. Hi. Well, it's saying an error occurred. So, no, okay. no, no. This, no, 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 no. This isn't a Joe fuck up. No, 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 no. No, wait, wait a second. No, 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 no. no. buck a system that doesn't want us. To be a fringe filmmaker means we don't do it for them. We do it for ourselves. To be an outlaw on the fringe means we'll die before we fail. Be an outlaw. Previously on uh, Romero Pictures Heavy Metal Indie Brigade, yeah. uh, the what screen of that? That was death. Infuriating. Hey, there's people here. You really went live this time. It said error. It's the first time I've ever seen anything happen with this particular program in over a year. So it kind of threw me off. That was that was a little weird. But <laughs> well, hey, it's good to whatever. see you, Joe. It's good to be back. You as well. I mean, although I was getting used to looking at Jason, you know, he has a little Everybody more hair. Everybody likes the new guy better. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just like what would married with children when they uh, changed the neighbor guy. Oh, I thought you were going to say when they changed the dog. Oh, okay, or the dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the neighbor guy, he was like always like the sitcom killer, though, because he was on like other sitcoms towards the end, and you knew it was just yeah, about yeah. time. It was, it was on its way. Now yeah. we got a lot of people showing up. We got. Let's see what we got here. We got Kate. What's up? How you doing, Kate? Sean. Your fucking straw post. There's one hole. There's no debate. It, uh, straws have one hole. Well, okay, but there's isn't there one, uh, or is that one continuous hole? Oh, are you really going to turn this into a debate? <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Terry Jarrell, Terry Jarrell, as people, some people call him, as we like to call him, DJ stands for Drone Jesus. Uh, the Romero Pictures Heavy Metal Indie Brigade resident Drone Jesus, Terry Jarrell, in attendance tonight. Hey, you mean this guy right um, here? Yeah, that guy. Look at that guy. He just looks fucking smarter than you. Right? right? Like, he looks smarter it, than everybody. He's like the smartest and, guy any of us know. So here's plug time. If you haven't seen Jer uh, Jerry's, Terry's, wow, uh, latest episode of the Drone Cav, go over to YouTube after. You were here last week. How'd you fuck up his name? Okay, so again, after this program, go ahead and check out the YouTube channel hey Joe, and hey his Joe, latest Joe, episode. Joe, Joe. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mute your mic. Okay. So what were you anyway. Saying about, uh, what were you saying about Jerry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you see the kind of bubbling idiot I was last week when I was like under pressure to get everything pulled off in time still with Jason pulling his hair out? He was oh, freaking in the a middle. Great job. I, I, it's a, just a huge thanks to Jason for stepping up and stepping in. And you, you, you guys both did a great job. So. No, Thank it was fun. very much from the bottom of my heart. Everybody watching, all the outlaws out there, I do apologize. We had some technical difficulties last week, and uh, it's been, well, it's been, uh, what would you call it? A, a cacophony of roller coasters. Is that a thing? Is that equivalent to shit show? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but a good one. A good one. There's yes. There's lots of good stuff coming. There's lots and lots of good stuff coming to talk about soon. All right, I got to hit up more people. Daniela is doing some cool shit. She actually has a drone now. Have you seen that? I have seen it, and she's killing it. She's doing some great stuff. And I checked on your merch, and it should be headed your way. So um, I did that today. So anyway, um, eh, we sorry, got I, I, our, our merch isn't fast. Everybody knows this, but it's cool as fuck. So when you get it, you'll dig it. Uh, we have Kelly, Mrs. DJ Kelly, here. Kelly, how are you? 
good to see you. Your, your snowmobile trip looked insane. Um, Terry was uh, extremely upset that he was in the snow uh, and the freezing cold. So, uh, <laughs> that's Ken. all of us heard. Yeah, no What's kidding. Up, Ken? Ken, great to see you. Oh, everything uh, just jumped on me. AJ. AJ, Big Ed, how's it going? Good to see you. Uh, another plug. See you, man. Wait a second. Wait a second. We got to we got to plug Ed a little. Uh, they just went to God. I had the poster at one point. Uh, him, Terry, and the crew from his new movie were at Bartow. I'm losing it. Steve Gray, you were there too. Anyway, they're gonna all gonna be over at the uh, Tampa Bay Scares next month, and uh, we're gonna do a little preview for on Terry's show of Tampa Bay Scares. A couple of the. Uh, Major panel members that are going to be there are going to show up. We're not going to give away too much right now, but just a little teaser. Boom. Sorry. What's up, Libby? Itai, how are you, my friend? Frank. Now he's saying my mic is low. Who's saying your mic is low? all this backstage. Is it still Hey, guys. See, if GCRs I boost the levels anymore, then we get feedback. Hmm. So, Oh, now I'm getting a damn it, Joe. Yeah, yeah, well, How's you know, that? it is. Joe's fucking everything up. My first day back, and Joe fucks it up. <sighs> Probably it, it's just purpose. because I'm enamored by your presence. And I know, it's, 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 it's crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't drank in a couple of days, so I may have a dry hangover. That's why I got the sweats right now. So. Oh, okay. is that what's going on? Oh, what's up, Matt? But, you know, since I'm with you, you know, here tonight, guess what I'm doing? <laughs> well, I have been driving you back toward it all day. So, <laughs> uh, let's see. Tammy Coleman, glad to be here this time. Sorry I've been a little M MIA lately, everybody. Again, my apologies, but I am back. Uh, so, uh, welcome, everybody, to your Friday night, and thank you for spending it with us here at the Romero Pictures Heavy Metal Indie Brigade. With me, your host, George C. Romero, and with me, as always, is my faithful, amazing producer and friend, Joe Ridgely. I missed you, man. I, thought I, I missed you as well. This time. Did I sell it? <laughs> you got to work on it here. A little much, a little thick. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's good to be back. It's good to be back. It's great to be here. There's been a lot going on. Let's see. We've got people still saying stuff. You're still at it, Joe. Uh, it's low for every <laughs> good to be back at Ty. What's up, Wheels? Now he's saying uh, my mic's low. Is it still is low? It, I I hear you fine. I don't know. Maybe it's because I turned my volume up. I have no idea. While you're playing with that, while we're uh, plugging things, everybody make sure to tune in Sunday, February 28th at 10 p.m. Eastern. Romero Pictures Indie Brigade presents The Wagner Wiles with Tyler Shea Cohn. Their guest is going to be J.M. Logan. Sunday. Hey, I did that pretty well. How's that? Eh. Is that better? <laughs> that sounds better. And stay tuned after Romero Pictures Indie Brigade for... David Lee Madison's The End of the Night. His guest is going to be Katie Barberi, who is an awesome actress. Uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Uh, she was in a Nickelodeon series and the original Garbage Pail Kids movie. That's going to be a good time. That is going to be a good time. We, yeah, yeah. we met her pre-show and she's a very, very cool lady. Man, it looks like people are trying to troubleshoot the microphone. Are we good? Can everybody hear me? Is everybody in? Oh, wow. Okay. She doesn't know if Cam is low or Joe is loud. I will move my mic away. Or is my mic actually working properly? And George's is just, you know. I don't know. I think my mic's probably the one that's probably right. Wow. So you say my mic's hot? <laughs> nice. Oh man, what else are we gonna talk about? Let's talk about uh let's talk about StreamYard. Let's talk about StreamYard and how awesome they are. So uh for those they are. You're gonna take it away this time since you've been absent. 
<laughs> for the longest time, people asked us how we did all this and how we made it look good and branded it and all of that stuff. And, and, and we're able to bring the guests up like we do and, and format everything like we do. And the answer is simple. It's StreamYard. Uh, and uh, we love it so much. We've been in it with them for a long time now. So uh, we're very happy to have them as a tech partner for Romero Pictures Heavy Metal Indie Brigade. Uh, so if y'all are trying to figure out how to get this shit off the ground, um, go to StreamYard. And s tell them that we sent you, and it's so easy, Joe can do it. That's easy. Wow. <laughs> also, we've got our microphones that we're, we're working on figuring out the levels for here, these, these beautiful Aston microphones. Uh, if you guys need a super, super quality uh, microphone at reasonable, reasonable prices that will last you forever and become like a, a regular weapon in your arsenal, go check them out, Aston Microphones. Uh, amazing, amazing company uh, with an outlaw CEO. So speaking of new equipment, Terry's been all up on some Insta360 shit over at the Drone Cav, which is pretty cool. Yeah, let me see if I have that picture again. I mean, look at the size of that camera and, and what it's capable of doing is just unbelievable. I know, it's crazy. Um, just the stuff that he's been showing me is, is, is... When I see stuff like that, you know, I realize the market that they're going after is sort of the social media market and the, you know, the quick videos and all the all that shit, but I, I see that stuff and I immediately start thinking about narrative applications and how to use that in narrative storytelling. And uh, I think um, I, I, I'm just blown away by how easy it is to push the envelope of creative storytelling with some of these new tools now. <laughs> He's referring to the mic, I'm assuming. <laughs> but you never can tell what can, so. <laughs> yes, Terry is the man. Terry is the man. Uh, oh, man. One thing I do have to everybody who's joining us, uh, either regularly or for the first time, do us a favor, please. If you like this content, please help us by subscribing to the Romero Pictures Indie Brigade YouTube channel. <laughs> I like the little glean of the teeth at the end. That was nice. That was real. You sold me, Joe. I'm going to go do it. I'm going to subscribe. Do it. Because there's a rumor that we may be strictly YouTube sooner or later. So, uh... Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's big changes coming, everybody. As soon as we figure out what they are, we're going to tell you. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, Terry saying, wait till you see what I have coming in the next Drone Cav episodes with the Insta360. Yeah, it's crazy. Terry actually went to space. <laughs> Terry's been living there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see his vans? <laughs> uh, uh, Steve saying, the camera, Terry caught some kick ass vid at Sci Fi Bartow last weekend. Thank you. That's what I was trying to remember. There it is. Uh-oh. Uh, Luciana is saying, no, she doesn't like the YouTube idea. Well, you know, the, the way things are changing with some formats, you never... And Terry, or some yeah. pimp-ass kicks. To, that, that's what, yeah, those are the alien vans. <laughs> Oops, that's wrong. <laughs> Terry Gerald. Yeah. Gerald, Jarl, Jorl, however the hell you want to pronounce his name this week. Facebook is becoming ridiculous with a variety of things. Van Envy, absolutely. Well, that just means you have to create a new login. That's not a big deal. Brandon. Oh, you know what? We should, let's dedicate, once we get into tonight's episode, let's all troubleshoot and help Luciana set up a new uh, YouTube account so she can watch us. And, and we'll all be there to help her through it. We're not going to do yeah. that. No, <laughs> but Brandon's been up to some <laughs> kick-ass shit as well, man. Uh, and Steve's saying, hell yeah, those vans were sick. Yeah, not everybody can have collector series, you know, glow-in-the-dark alien vans. But whatever. Uh, so. What else? What else should we talk about? If you want to know anything else that's going on, oh, I've turned in. Uh, up to issue seven now of the rise, so that's cranking along. 
Um, I yeah, I saw uh, somebody said I think Sean said that uh, he wasn't he still hasn't gotten his subscription issue or whatever. But um, I, I don't know what to do about that. When it comes to our very slow merch, which you should still support us and and get, <laughs> even though it takes forever apparently. You just go to romeropictures.com forward slash merch and check us out. Check it out. Oh, yeah. I think I got one of those things here somewhere. Uh, Huh? It's been so long since I've had to do it that, uh, yeah, there's the merch thing. George? Hmm? I missed you. Oh, you're going to make me blush. No, you're not. (laughs) (laughs) I missed you too, Joe. (laughs) I missed everybody. I missed I missed being here. I missed doing this. This is like it's a big part of my my sad life. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing I'm concerned about is we we've got an empty green room. That's all right. I we'll blame keep, you. We'll just keep shooting the shit. We'll just keep shooting the shit. Oh, merch. Yeah, and again, merch. Luciana. Apparently, it's slow. This is not the first time. This this. Slow. Ever since the COVID stuff hit, like it's hit or miss whether or not they're fast with getting merch done and out. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. So, well, you guys got to um, be quicker than that, and uh, you know, jump yeah. on the well, wagon. Well, Joe, I think you know. knows somebody. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but uh, we do our best, and I do stay on top of them. So, if anybody has ordered merch and you haven't gotten anything or it's slow, um, just send us a message, uh, and I do personally jump on that. Uh, at least for now, so um, I'm I'm happy to go and try to figure out what's going on and, and get anything to you as quickly as possible. Nice. Uh, what, Wheels is saying he loves his hoodie. Very big exciting stuff happening with the veterans compound. Oh well, then you know what? And I will give you full to, screen. Best of luck to Gunny, who's out there in the field. Um, everything's going well. It's not that kind of big news, Joe. No. No. Okay. Did you miss me? Hey. No, it's just everything's moving forward. Uh, I've started talking with an attorney. We're moving forward with all the proper way of doing everything. And, like, we've got all the paperwork filed. But I guess because of the nature of it, uh, the Veterans Compound is actually going to eventually, um, you know, work to produce films uh, while being a resource for veterans. Um, Because it's a nonprofit, I guess there's just some shit that you got to work with a lawyer to figure out so that you do it all the right way so um anyway that's huh, where ed I'm gale's at. here and it's a big deal what ed gale's here i've had ed on the show before hey, hey ed good to see you <laughs> good to see you ed yeah kate it's big it's a big deal i mean it doesn't sound like much but believe it or not like i you all of you know how how long and hard it, it, it takes to get a movie off the ground and all the different steps you have to go through and all the bullshit hoops you got to jump through and all that other stuff um it's it's the same thing even probably more when you're trying to do it you know for a nonprofit. um you just have to make sure that you do everything absolutely right dot all your t's and cross your i's you know <laughs> and uh, it looks like see. we have somebody trying to get into the green room are you prepared or no you good to go Okay. Well, wasn't sure. You, you, you kind of looked perturbed. Not even disturbed, perturbed. It's because I didn't get to cook today. Well, I, I saw the chicken nuggets with the macaroni and cheese and the ketchup on top. <laughs> that wasn't mine. <laughs> <laughs> but you were tagged in it. <laughs> anyway, we have Ryan, Ryan Lambert in the green room right now. And Ryan has been on the show before. Awesome guest. You guys will know him from, obviously, the Monster Squad, Kids Incorporated, and so much other stuff. That and he's an ex- excellent musician. Uh, please welcome Ryan Lambert. Oh damn! I didn't know we were doing that. <laughs> What's right, up, George? Ryan? How are there's you? so many people. There's so many people in my apartment right now. I had to put my mask on. Surrounded. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, man? I'm great. How are you guys? I'm good. I'm good. You're real low. Your volume's real low. Oh yeah. Well, 
I don't have a I don't have an external microphone, so. No, I'll wait a minute. You're a musician. A You're that? a musician, and you don't have an external mic. I know, not here. I don't. In my studio. Oh, okay, Francisco, fair enough. I have plenty. <laughs> oh sure, throw the San Francisco studio in. And, okay, we understand. Boom. <laughs> well, thank you for coming back on the show, man, and sitting down and talking with me. Um, got it. Got yeah, it. I'm sorry. We had it's been a crazy, weird uh, season this season. So, uh, anyway, yeah. happy to have you here, man. Happy to see you. Big fan, happy and uh, it means a lot to me that you have uh, been a part of of this season of the uh, Indie Brigade, man. Welcome to it. And uh, it's nice to finally meet you face to face and sit down and rap with you a little bit. Sure. So. Um, Joe, what you look like you want to say something. Well, I, I was expecting him and Andre, and Andre is MIA at the moment. That's cool. We're just, that, that we're just awesome. shit, man. I mean, you know, Ryan, I, mean, I guess thing, like uh, there's no need in you introducing yourself to everybody watching, but you know, where I like to come from things, I like to, you know, we're just meeting. So I just kind of like to just kind of talk and hang out for a little bit. I mean, I, I don't necessarily like to. I try to stay away from things that maybe you're tired of talking about. I try to stay away from, you know, I just like, uh, I just feel like getting to know you a little bit, you know? I mean, I think one of the things that's intriguing to me is that you're a musician. And, um, you know, the other thing that's, that's super interesting to me is how long you've been around this business. And, you know, one of my favorite questions to ask uh, and talk about uh, with folks who have been around this business for a minute, like me, uh, is, you know, what are, I, I like to talk about creativity as an abstract uh, and, and how, you know, that's what that sort of meant going into this business uh, as a kid and how that kind of definition has changed over your life and how the, the industry and your experiences in it have helped sort of shape what you define as creativity and, and how you move forward with it. Well, um, I started out mostly in uh, music, like as a singer, um, I was in like, a, well, it was a combination of like, it was musical comedy theater, you know, I came from, uh, you know, the full on like, I'm a Yankee little man, you know, I was like a little <laughs> kid wearing like, uh, like a sequin jacket, and, you know, the whole thing. And, uh, and, and, you know, I got the bug to really want to like start getting into do a professional. And that kind of turned into uh, my mom taking me to like an audition for the first time, my first audition, and uh, I got it, <laughs> which was Kids Incorporated, my right. very first audition, and I got it. So I was like, "This is easy. This is it." <laughs> I was like, "This is how you do it." Like I just, I, you know, my mom said I went to see E. T. And I said, I, now I, I saw Henry Thomas, and I said, I want to I wanna do that. I, that's what I want to do. And my mom said, okay. So I did. <laughs> so that was it. But the thing about the business side of the whole thing, I guess what you're trying to ask is, like, what's changed over the years, like, I guess, like, artistically and stuff. Well, first of all, number one, I, I quit when I was 19. Uh, so that whole period of my, like, childhood, you know, acting experience was that uh, that was only about five years that whole time right and then i've and then i've been uh i've been in bands ever since i got the bug again about maybe seven years ago and i started to do theater in san francisco and but now i'm so ne but then i came back to la so now i'm back in la started auditioning again found a manager yada yada and man has this business changed it is absolutely totally flipped from when I was a kid. When I was, when I was a kid, I would go on, I would go on an audition, and there would be the same, maybe twelve kids, sitting in the room. It was like me, uh, Feldman, Andre, uh, Corey Haim, uh, Christian Slater, uh, Keith Gookin. It was just all of us, and we just, all those parts were just rotating. You know, this person would get that, this person would do this thing. And uh, now it's just like a smorgasbord of everybody who just wants to be on television, you know. Now I go on an audition in L.A. and it's like every, uh, every ethnic group for the same part, um, every sort of age group 
for the same part. And uh, most of the people that I see, you know, are like people that probably just want to get on The Bachelor. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Like that, that that's their goal is just to get on the cover of people magazine and it's like the craft so the craft is kind of missing from the whole thing and i believe when we were kids even you know because we all took classes and things like that and uh, i was at stella adler and we would uh it was a, it was a job it was a craft and you had to learn your craft it's the same thing i hear from like because sometimes i teach uh acting as well and uh i hear it all the time like uh I always say, film, watch film, watch film, keep watching film, watch them all, watch every television show you can possibly watch, everything, just watch it all. Doesn't matter if you like it or not, just learn it, know it, because when you, when you get called to get to be on, uh, you know, some sitcom that you never heard of, at least you'll know what it is and how the tone is. That's part of the craft, of learning what it is. Yeah. I don't want to watch this show necessarily, but I do, just a few episodes, whatever. But films, films, films. And then the students always say, uh, you know, I'll say, like, watch, go watch Touch of Evil. And they'll say, but, but I've never, but I wasn't born yet. <laughs> I'm like, neither was I. <laughs> I don't, I don't think I could, yeah, I don't think I could you know, stay in a so conversation a just have like this that. Notion that the is just to get famous. Just get famous. That's all they want. They just want to be famous. And they forget about like that it's an actual job and you have to study for it, you know. What that what must that be like trying to teach acting to a, a sort of sort of this new batch? The new batch, that's an interesting uh, the new batch. Like, what must it be <laughs> was, like? Wasn't that a gremlins acting? movie? <laughs> to, Don't to, talk to the new batch of kids. The gremlins thing. Um, <laughs> that don't uh, even realize there's a craft to it. Um, they have no idea. They you know, no what's that like? What's that even like? How do you even get a performance? I'm asking because I'm about to direct a couple of movies and I'm, I'm going to need to figure out how to get performances out of some, uh, s some of the new batch, I think. So, I mean, how do you do that? How do you get, how do you get to them and speak to them? I think, that, uh, I think the best way is to sort of... I don't know. I guess it's like teaching any kid or anything. Are they children that you're going to be act, like, acting? Or are they just like... No, no. That they're, just, well, they're older. Just, yeah, just, you know, the new generation of... <laughs> but still baggage. kids to him. Yeah. And you, Joe. <laughs> and Joe. <laughs> I mean, I think the best thing to do is like whatever project is. Uh, maybe like find like 10 films that are comparable in, a, in, a, you know, in different lights. Especially like for particular characters. You know, like what you want to get out of them, like kind of, you know, there's a fine line between like a line reading and, and also saying it's kind of like this. Right. You know, I think there's right, a little right, right. push that you can give them. Like, you know, you need to watch this uh, Jimmy Stewart film or you need to go see this Johnny Depp movie or whatever and, and, and say, you know, like, but watch him in, the, in this particular instance, you know, like he, these mannerisms, these kind of things, like these things, like step into those shoes for a minute. You yeah. know, and sometimes, uh, sometimes it's not easy to find a character, uh, especially if you're playing way outside of either your comfort zone or, or, you know, or you've got prosthetics on and all that stuff. It's maybe a little harder to find all that stuff. But um, I think it's a lot easier if you have some. Every actor should have a toolbox. Agreed. You know? and, and then when you go in and you like read a script, every time I read a script, I go, OK, what can I use? What can I use? What do I got? What do I got? Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's. Uh, I think it's really. I think it's really good. I think it's useful to at least tell them to open their toolbox and let them figure out what that actually is. Maybe throw a few tools in there yourself. Yeah. And then see what happens. Well, and it's interesting because you said you know maybe pick ten movies and show them movies and you know it's funny I find when I when I do direct and when I. Uh, work with actors, I end up speaking in other movies. It's like its own language. Um, sure. You know, and uh, it's just funny even how that language has changed over the years. 
um, yeah. but it's 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 interesting to me. So uh, I got a I, couple of comments here and questions that uh, I'd like to take real fast, and then we have a, another guest waiting in the uh, green room. Chris says that I started acting as a child. I went to a million classes and workshops. Seems like a lot of people I see today, at least in the indie fi field, seem to go to classes specifically to learn how to audition, but they don't know a lot about the history. Interesting. That, that's a great question. <laughs> I think he was trying to make that's a point. Yeah, but... Uh, this question's for you. <laughs> this one's for you, Ryan. Can you see that? What's your next project, Ryan? Uh, that is a picture of somebody with state with uh, fur. Um, uh, my next project is I'll probably uh, go do the dishes right after this, and then I'll probably uh, watch a few films, um, and then I'll probably read in bed. Those are some good projects. No, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm working on a screenplay right now. Can't really say nice. too much about it. Not that it's like some secret thing or anything. It's just like I'm so like messed up in the process right now, and like so many outlines going through my head. Uh, but you know, hopefully that'll come to fruition one day as an actual project. Um, I have a new record coming out at some point getting mastered right now uh, with my band nice. in San Francisco called Kill Moi. Uh, other than that, I, uh, I just signed with a new uh, management company here in LA. And uh, actually my manager uh, joined a new agency and so she took me with her. And uh, it's a larger agency. So we're just getting kind of, uh, you know, acquainted with uh, each other. And nice. uh, I'm probably, you know, like, who knows what this project could be? It could, I might be dead body number two on Law and Order, one of the Law and Order things, you know. I don't know. As far as acting goes, it's, I'm auditioning, let's say. So we'll see what happens. Well, it's interesting okay. too because you said you're writing a screenplay, and you know, a lot of the a lot of the folks in the brigade, you know, we're all indie filmmakers, we're all creatives, and and so yeah. many of us. Um, write our own stuff and we write our own projects to develop and produce um, yeah. and uh, you know we actually uh, have dedicated a lot of time to uh, the writing process here so anytime you want to talk about writing or if you just want to come on and, and, and talk through some shit like we'll do it live like I'm sure. all down for that kind of stuff I'd anything love. I can do sure. um, to try to facilitate just you know, the whole point of what I'm trying to get across here, Ryan, is that, um, you know, so many people, and I think so many of the people that the Indie Brigade appeals to, um, you know, we spend our lives in these creative vacuums and we think, Jesus, you know, um, nobody kind of gets what we go through or, or what the process is like, and, and that's really not the case. There's a whole lot of us that are, that are going through it, creatively speaking. So that's kind of what the Brigade is here for, is to just let everybody know that, you know, That's we're not right. all out there in this vacuum. We're all in this kind of creative thing together. So anytime you want it to do that, a, man, uh, we're, we're all down It's an interesting that. thing to be on your writing. own. Yes. Huh? True. It's an interesting what? thing to be on, uh, be a writer on your own. And, uh, you know, especially having a, it's nice that you have a collective to uh, sort of bounce ideas off of and make films together and stuff like that. Um, I really believe that is like the... I mean, it's been like it's been going that way for a long time, but I think it, it, it's coming to a point where it's just like you know, yes, I have a manager, and yes, they work really hard for me, and yes, I'm going out on auditions. But the truth of the matter is, is like, I think you just got to fucking do it on your own. Mm -hmm. You just got to do your own thing. And like, I'm 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 at age now where it's like it's time for me to not have to like put on like a bailiff costume, you know, and go like you know, raise your right hand. Okay, cut, and then I'm off the set. It's like I want to like I want to like be, I want to be a heroin addict like on the streets, you know. I want to like try. I want to do new things, and and you know they, they they keep you know they keep throwing out there these stupid fucking parts where it's like I can't do this. I, I yeah. this isn't acting to me. This is not real, and, and it does get a little frustrating. And to go back to that guy's point about like uh, auditioning, like there there are classes. There studying to audition. Yeah, you study to audition. But it, it, it's mostly for 
I would say that's mostly for, like, I wouldn't take that class. I've, I've been auditioning since I was 13. So right. uh, I already know the tricks and the, you know, the, you know, the things to do. Um, I know there's a lot of people that don't know how to do uh, self-tapes now. Because now, because of COVID, we're not even going in to see the casting director or the director or, or the producer. We're doing it at home. And they expect it to look really, I have, my, my setup looks like shit right now, sorry, I didn't really, really do it that well. But like when I do it, an audition, like there's a backdrop and like I've got overhead lights and like the whole thing. I very, I like, you know, I use my iPhone mostly and like, the, I gotta get, you're right, I gotta get better sound. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, and, and I know a lot of people are taking classes just to learn how to audition in that way. Like to be auditioning at home because because these casting directors now, they want it to look like it's going to look like when the, when you shoot the actual movie. They're like, this is well, going to look good. You've got but now here's what's camera. fucked up, right? Like, at least before, like, the COVID thing, you would go into the audition, you'd do your read, you'd be in a room with people who at least represented the production. Uh, if not right. the director, you were there with somebody, you know, who spoke creatively for the production. Now it's all, like, from your home, there's all this disconnected shit. Now you get something, and you show up on set, and it's the first time that presumably half the people there have even left their fucking house, let alone yep. been around other people. Like, what's <laughs> like what's that do to you as an actor? Show it, like, you know, what's that got to be like? Does that make it easier or harder? Or, I mean, you know, what's that like? Well, there, there, there's pros and cons to me about doing self-tapes at home. Um, one, it, I, I would say a pro, probably the biggest pro, would be that um, you can do it as many times as you want until you feel that you've gotten it right. You know? So, you know, you go into a casting office and they go, okay, go. And you go, have it, th th oh, I'm sorry, I messed up. They're like, that's okay. Bye. And you're like, oh, fuck. Like, I didn't even get a second shot at that? And like, yeah. You know, here at home, I've got a little clicker in my hand that turns the camera on and off. If I flub a line, I hit stop and I go, all right, you know, let's go again, let's go again. All right, and, you know, in my head, I'm going, action, and I hit the button. Right. And, and I go. And I could do it 30 times if I want to. Hopefully, I don't have to do it 30 times. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been, they've called me one take Ryan in the past, so uh, <laughs> I, I save producers a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> uh, we got a question up here. During the five year span of time you acted as a kid, how did you avoid the Hollywood pitfalls, young actors? You mentioned like Freeman and, Hay and others fell victim to. Is that one of the reasons you walked away at 19? If that's too personal, I get it, but. Uh, not, that wasn't the reason I walked away. Uh, I walked away from music. Um, there were a lot of other factors involved as far as, uh, you know, I was a kid and I was getting a little discouraged because like I wasn't getting the things that I wanted to get or I would get them. I'd sign the contract and then they'd say, oh, wait, you're not emancipated. Oh, so we're not, you're not going. Oh, okay. Uh, great. <laughs> uh, so I'm not, now I'm not in that film. And then it goes on to be this big, huge movie. I'm like, damn it. Uh, there's a particular one, which is an interesting story. Is I I, I got a part. Uh, I was I was one of the kids in uh, a film called uh, it was called Grounded, and it was gonna it was uh, we were gonna go to Mexico City to shoot it. I was I had my bags were actually packed like actually like by the door ready to go, and they called and they said the director uh, had some health issues, and uh, they weren't gonna let him do it. And so the new director came in. Actually, that, that director was Stuart Gordon. And they weren't going to let him do it, the film. So they got a new director. The, director, the new director said, I want to, we need to, you know, uh, redo the casting. But you're on the top of the list. And you're, you're, you're probably going to do the film, but he just wants to, like, screen test you again. And I said, <laughs> And so I didn't do it, and uh, they went. And they went and shot the film. They changed the name when it came out to "Honey, I Shrunk the Kids." Oh man! So that was the big. <laughs> so things like that kept happening, and I was just, you know, I was like, you know what? I want to be a rock star anyway. I'm fucking out of here. Like I don't, I don't do this anymore. I don't do it anymore. I love it, but I don't want to do it anymore. What was the front right. top of that guy's question? Oh, oh the, getting caught up in the whole thing. I didn't because I had really good parents. To tell you the truth, you know. Those people that you mentioned, those people's parents like are not very nice people. 
and they got screwed out of a lot of things. Uh, you know, uh, I won't. Go, I'm not going to obviously tell you know my personal tales of those situations, but um, I did see a lot of things that you know that would that would make it understandable that they that they, that those kind of things happened to them. You know, I went to the set. I my parents were there. We we wrapped for the day, and I went home and watched Three's Company or whatever. You know, so <laughs> my mom made dinner. La la la. I maybe one of the right. cast members. For, like you know, I went to Andre's house during Monster Squad, and we like shot bow and arrow in the backyard. And his parents were great, and his sister was great, and like we had friends, and it was good. If you if you're in this business and you're a kid and you're basically alone, I'd say you're fucked. Yeah. You know, you're gonna get caught up in a lot of shit, and people are gonna take advantage of you. Have, you have yeah. To around yourself with the right people if you're going to do it as a kid. And I, I don't discourage children from acting. I think, obviously, we need them, too, or else what would right. Stranger Things look like? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we well, you know, look, the, this we business the is fucked squad. up. The, this business is fucked up, uh, you know, all the way around, and, and it, it will take advantage of the weakest uh, in the room, and a lot of times that's children, and it's fucked up. And, uh, Absolutely. And, and we'll Absolutely. leave it at that. So. I mean, there were laws put into place, Jet, the Jackie Coogan law was put into place to protect children, you know, because their parents were stealing all their money. Yeah. So now they everything's going to goes into a trust fund. And there's yeah. so many, like, laws now where it's like the kid, a kid can only work for, like, five hours. That's it. So you better get it in. And that's the other thing, too. Like, if you don't know what if – you're, if you're a kid and you don't know what you're doing, and, like, a, and like the DP goes, Ryan, eyes – and you're supposed to look over there and like he needs to see your eyes. He needs to look into it. He needs to focus. He needs they're doing a whole bunch of things. There's lighting. There's things. And if a kid's going, ooh, ooh, his finger in his nose, the you know, producer's going, geez, that's Christ, come on. <laughs> one of the things one of the things that I actually um, tell a lot of, of, of newer filmmakers, uh, and to this day I still do this, I, I try not to do I try not to tackle any films or, or anything that has kids in it. Um, because there's just a lot of there's a lot of red tape that goes with having to work with kids and there's a lot of you can only work them a few hours and you have to have tutors and all this other stuff and when you're working with some yeah. of these lower budgets you can't I mean it'll kill it'll it'll eat up 10% of your budget you could spend on a different part of your film so Absolutely. Um, if at exactly. all possible try to avoid it is what I they always you know, say don't that's, work that's with these kids days. or animals <laughs> huh yeah no yeah. kids no animals yeah you know um and it's it's you know it's funny sometimes the reaction you get is like, well, why would I not, you know, put kids in the story? Well, why would you? You know, I mean, especially today, it's all it's all different today, and it's so there's so many just things that will just make it so that if you if you think you can shoot out a kid's scene in a day, you can't. It's going to be like a week. So, you know, easily, um, easily. Joe, yeah, I think, uh, do we have Andre here? I believe we do. Andre, give me a thumbs up if you're ready. And ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Andre I don't want to keep him waiting in the green room. That guy. Hey, man. Uh, hi, hi, is this where you audition for the bailiff? <laughs> <laughs> am, I, am, I in the right, am I in the right place? Yeah, no, you're, you're in, in right place. crackhead number one place. Because I was over there auditioning the, uh... for, yeah, I was auditioning for the Bachelor, and then they said, "Come over and meet for the Bailiff." So we're Can you the hold right that place? Bible okay. up? Can you hold that Bible up for us? No, not like that. Thanks. Next. <laughs> Andre, you can actually leave. I got the Bailiff. I already got the Bailiff. Oh, so I don't need to do my Richard Mall. <laughs> you can. Yeah. <laughs> How's it going, hey, man? <laughs> good. 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 Thank you for coming on. I'm sorry. This is. Uh, thank you guys for coming on the show a couple of times prior to this. I'm. I'm so happy to be sitting here talking with you guys. Yeah. No. Good. So I was a little late. I ended up having to again restart my computer right when you were starting, and that takes you know like forever for some reason. It's, There's uh, all kinds of shit going but, yeah. on this year. It's really. It's been a weird year between the tech issues and some other shit. <laughs> no, it's just been. It's been a crazy year. But, uh, but we're here. Anyway, you, you guys are here run. now. I'm here finally, so I'm happy to have you. We started, Ryan and I started talking 
We started talking about kind of how creativity, his perspective on creativity as an abstract has evolved since he got into the business as a kid uh, and grown through it. And that kind of just took us down a whole bunch of different interesting <laughs> roads, so, <laughs> which I think you heard some of. Um, yeah, I heard, I heard the most of it. You can call them tangents. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm I am I am king of tangents. So well, let's get started. Uh, let's start with Wolfman's Got Nards. What's going on with that uh, since since you were last on? Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, still chugging along in U.S. and Canada, and I was uh, there. May have been some forward progress this afternoon. Actually, uh, not announcing it yet, but there may be some uh, international. Stuff going on there that uh, I hope to post or tweet um, in the next day or two, and you know, so we will get it out. You know, it's been just such a—it's uh, literally been a pain in the ass for the last you know little bit, just with the delays and then things not happening for one or two different reasons. And uh, you know, this should have been out you know a year and a half ago, and um, or 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 more. <laughs> And yeah. uh, we should have been done with it and on to the next thing by now. And uh, But, you know, that's how movies go and that's how this industry works. And you take what you can get. And then you had this weird year of 2020 and pandemic and, you know, and starting from scratch and all that stuff. So, um, you know, uh, you know, it is what it is. And, um, you know, you're just looking for that next uh, bailiff. So, <laughs> so let me ask you this. With all the stops and starts, with all the stuff, right? Like, what what creatively, and I'm not talking financial responsibilities or anything like that. I'm talking just creatively. Like, how do you keep that part of you going through these brick walls? What feel like, and I've been there, man. And, I'm, I, you know, there's st stuff I'm still hitting brick walls on. And there's some stuff that I hit 10 years worth of brick walls on before I got through the last one. So, like, the question is, what is it that keeps you as a creative? You know, one of the things that, a lot of people reach out to me about is like, man, I just keep failing. I keep getting rejected and I just don't want to fucking quit. I'm going to stop. This was going to go. Now it's not. This guy was going to fund that. Now he's not. I'm just going to fucking <laughs> give it all up. Like, you know, it's a, it's a common thing, you know, among a lot of indies and what, what kept you pushing through some of these, these issues that you ran into, man. You know, I think it's, uh, <sighs> It's just you got. It's, it's just perseverance. You've you've just got to see it through, and you've you've either most of the time, especially with this situation, we were waiting. You're usually waiting on somebody else, and that's always the problem, right? Uh, you know, another company. Uh, you're waiting on lawyers. You're waiting on you know a sales agent. You're waiting on a distributor. You're waiting on X, Y, or Z. Uh, in in this particular case, and you know, and that's only because we were fortunate enough to get to that point. You know, if you're talking about most creatives, you know, we're talking about after you've actually made and finished and festival the movie, which nine out of 10 don't get to that far. So, you know, we feel very fortunate, of course, but even during that time on the creative side, you've got to keep my creative side never stops. And, you know, Ryan and I sit around all the time when we could sit around all the time. And, uh, we come up with silly ideas or great ideas or, you know, we'll be on the phone for an hour and a half just talking about crazy shit. And that keeps your creativity going. And I know Ryan has an outlet, you know, musically. I don't have a music outlet because I can't play anything. Um, but, um, you know, and Ryan's super creative on, you know, TV concepts, film concepts, story wise. You know, we come up with crazy animation ideas. And you just got to keep, you know, cranking those out because while you're waiting for the one thing you think may or may not go, you, you've got to have three or four more different ideas because honestly, that thing that you think might be going, the odds are it's not going to. And one of these other things that are behind that are actually what's going to, you know, get this, you know, get kick started, not crowdfunded, but, you know, that kickstart of momentum. And you've got to be ready for that. One of the things I decided, and Ryan knows this more than anybody, when I moved back uh, to L.A. like in uh, 2013, 14, you can't you can't be a one horse guy. I mean, you have to have like four or five concepts, ideas. You got to be talking about them all because you never know which one is going to actually spark. And I moved back to L.A. Ryan and I ended up moving back to L.A. kind of almost almost near the same time. 
and I had moved back for a specific television project for a show that I, uh, that I had created. And I went to LA, ended up spending time and money. We actually shot a spec pilot for it as it, it's more than a proof of concept. It's a little bit less than a full episode. And it looks and sounds like, you know, a, a, a bazillion dollars. And that was the pitch piece. And I honestly did a deal with the first studio that I pitched it to. And six months later, their channel disintegrated. Their network was gone. And so you have to start again, but they wanted it. And so they wanted to keep it there and do it somewhere else and just not put it on their channel, but go out and sell it to somewhere else. But they wanted to partner up. So that's another six months. Right. To, to realize that it's middle. not happening. Right. With now and a so new middleman in the whole with thing. new with now a new middleman. And ironically, yeah. that middleman actual individual ended up losing his job at this particular place and everything that was on the table in development and getting ready to that we were working on. The new guy came in like 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 Ryan and Honey, I tried to get everything gets pushed off the table and you're shit out of luck. And mm-hmm. but you've got to start again. And what's interesting about that time is right when that happened, I couldn't really just turn the gauge again and, and, and service and start pitching that show full off the bat because I had just sold a show to Nerdist that Ryan and I co-hosted and we went into contract phase on that. And then we went into development on that a couple months later, all at the same time that I was developing the deal for the documentary with my studio partner, Pilgrim Media Group. And we went into production and started shooting that not long after that. So I had two projects going simultaneously. Ryan and I shot 22 episodes of our show in the middle of making this documentary. And it was insane. And that original show that I moved out to, you know, moved back to do that was ready to go and they wanted it uh, sat on the back burner. I still have it. I mean, it's uh, I, I love it. And Ryan knows which one I'm talking about. And it's, you know, it's crazy that, you know, things y- you can't rely on that one thing and you've got to be flexible. You got to be nimble and you may have a favorite project. But what I what I always said years and years and years ago, I was like, I do not want to be if I'm going to be a creative and have scripts or try to do it. It's really hard when you're the only creative. And if you're going to pedal a script around, it's probably going to take you at least three years to get it in some, some doors and then it may get looked at and it may be another year. So now you're in year four. And then by the time someone actually likes it and if they actually make it, you're in year five. Mm-hmm. Then by the time it's actually finished to come out, you're at the end of year five, into year six. And then everybody goes, oh, shit, we made a movie. What's my next? Like, I got to do a next one. You're out. It's way too late. You needed to have while you were doing that, you needed to have them lined up. But what yeah. happens is most people get so tired of beating that one horse to the death that they don't want to do it anymore. And, you know, I, I, that's don't handle it that way. You know, have a couple different options. If you hit a roadblock, go around it. If you hit a, you know, if you run your car into a ditch, then maybe your script isn't that good or your, you know, your development idea isn't bad. You're talking to the wrong people. Um, but everybody thinks this is easy to do. Everybody thinks they can come up with a great idea and sell a show to a network or to a streaming service. And I'm like, look, let me tell you something. The most creative people on the planet and huge names do it, and nine out of ten of their stuff doesn't get made. Mm-hmm. Preach, man! I'm telling you, so. it's like I just had this conversation yesterday. Uh, you know, and and it's kind of the way I've done it with a few different things, and I've got some projects that are the same thing that I've been sitting around for years, and I talk about them in meetings, and and then there's that ebb and flow, and you talk about it in enough meetings that you know some other people you're going to meet with have heard about it, so you stop bringing it up and then it's like, well, how long do I have to wait before I can bring that one up again? And, you know, and, and so you kind of sit on it because then, you know, there comes that breaking point where somebody will say, hey, whatever happened to that other one you were talking about? <laughs> and you can no longer say, well, I'm still working on it. And you right. can no longer say, well, it fucking failed because neither of those are good. So you have to kind of figure out how to phase them out of your conversation until you can kind of bring it back in. Maybe if you meet somebody else and you never know, like, you know, I got a phone call a couple of weeks ago from a guy who has a friend at, you know, a high level friend at a streamer who greenlights projects. And he says, hey, so my buddy just got promoted. He now greenlights projects over at this streamer and he's looking for X, Y and Z. And he throws out like the term like uh, grounded and elevated and all these <laughs> things that didn't make sense. And he wanted a concept. And he said, what do you have? 
And I said, well, shit, I don't really, you know, all of those things conflict, but I got this, this, and this. And he said, I like that one. And I said, okay, here you go. And here's a pitch deck, right? Because like you said, you just don't fucking know. Like yeah. what's, what's going to happen? You have to no, be, you, be ready you, you, to You to certainly go. don't. You know? you know, and another another thing that's a, a great way, especially for, you know, your your followers or people that are creatives or trying to get their own projects done. Um, your project is not the only one in the world. Uh, you can still push that and promote it. But if you have a buddy or you've met somebody through, a, you know, social media or through an event or through a, a third party and they've got a project see what you can do to help that project actually get made. You might one learn something and you might make some contacts while you're doing it and you might improve your chances or improve your project yourself. Your project, I guarantee you is not the only one in the world and you know, jump on other people's projects, try to help them get theirs done. And then, you know, you can learn, you meet people, you can network, you get some experience behind you. You might see how something actually gets done. So if, and when yours does go, you're not flailing around in the mud trying to figure it out. Uh, and then it's also, you know, a situation where a lot of people think this is a very selfish industry uh, just because of kind of the persona and the names. And you know what? It really isn't. It really is a collaborative industry. And it's a mm -hmm. yeah, it's about who, you know, and contacts. But even on the creative and getting shit done, it, it's 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 a collaborative effort. And if you're doing it all on your own, you're, you're pushing a rock uphill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you'll never get to the top. You know, you got to find the right people to partner up with. You got to find the right people who bring what you need to the project, and you have to give them some value in return, because it can't yeah. be the kind of thing where, you know, you're always calling, you know, hey buddy, hey buddy, I got another thing. Hey buddy, I got another thing. You know? Yeah. Unless, until one of them goes big and becomes the next Stranger Things, then I'm sure that guy will take your phone call every time. But you know. <laughs> well, that's a, that's the brass ring, and that's you know of the people that get to that level. Um, <laughs> You know, that's one in a thousand, you know, for yeah. everybody that can just, you know, walk into Netflix and go, bam, here's my next project. And they go, we love it. There's 7,000 other of us that are going, you want to read this? <laughs> mm -hmm. And they're all saying, by the way, they're all giving everybody the same reaction. We love it. You know, uh, yeah, that's an industry a street yeah. where here you go. I want to see what you think about this. I was once told years and years and years ago. By, uh, by a very, very old producer who I'm, I'm pretty sure is dead by now. But he was a pretty, pretty big guy, and he said, look, it's the only town, and he meant the business, right? But he said, it's the only town where you can die from encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> one, of the, one of the best examples of this industry is actually the fake movie set up in Argo. Uh -huh. And it's I just watched that like an hour ago. It is when Goodman and Arkin are setting up the fake production and they're just talking about and they just fly by through kind of these industry things and everybody thinks it's absurd. It's exactly how it goes down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really does. And, and, and you know, it's a business uh, where yes rarely means yes. No always means no, but be hard pressed to get a hard no most of the time you don't get a no you get a yes but you get a yes next week you get a yes next month you get a we love it <laughs> we're gonna move forward with this we're gonna be in touch don't ask us when yeah um you know but you know and then months and months go by or or you get a contract i've had it go with me where i, I signed a contract a very legit contract and it turns out they had no intention of making the project they just wanted it off the market because they were working on something similar Oh yeah, that happens too. That's like uh, that's the old Dean Smith coaching trick. He would recruit the other best player and bench him so he wouldn't have to play against him in the <laughs> in the tournament. <It's laughs> uh, but yeah, and you know the other thing, if we're looking for advice, and uh, you know Ryan and I have you know experienced this and talked about it too, is okay. So something's caught on one of your ideas or a project and they're like, yes, we love, it. we're going to do it. Let's go to the next phase. And even if you get to that kind like it is not done until it's done. And you can't assume that this one person is going to be there tomorrow. Per my example at a giant studio, you know, I, we, I was waiting around for a contract. Like we sent our red lines back and we were waiting for their response. Mm -hmm. And it took someone else in there after a month of radio silence to go oh by the way he's been fired and all of his yeah. projects got dumped and we're like 
oh, great. Um, thanks for telling us. And then also, hey, dude, thanks for being super professional and going, hey, by the way, I'm no longer here. So, you know, start talking, or taking your project somewhere else. <laughs> you know, and that, and that literally with those two things was over a year that this that this show was at one giant studio for a long t- for over a year. And then you got to start from scratch. So you can't get, you can't get discouraged. And then what happens to you as the creative, right? You're going through this and, and we're talking about this stuff and a lot of it's funny and a lot of it's not funny when you're going through it. But when you recount it, you recount it in kind of a funny way. And then, but what you have to realize is all the shit that goes on in here and in here during that time of the people while you're going through this, right? Like this is where we all tend to feel like we're going through something nobody's ever gone through before. And, 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 you know, it, it becomes about a matter of survival during that time. You know, everybody thinks, well, I've made it now. I've made a movie or I've made this and this is going to be what I do. It's still the same thing with every project and you still have to just grind it out. Uh, Mm -hmm. And you have to grind out between when you get those yeses and when you get those checks, you know, and, uh, it's, it can be hard, but I think the hardest part about it is when you've got something that you put so much of yourself creatively into. And it's just floating out there for a year or two, you know, um, the figuring out how to survive. That's the easy part. Figuring out how to keep your creative alive. That's the hard part because you've got it so invested in this thing. You have to do other things, which goes back to your original point, Andre. You have to develop other things. And the fact that you guys just develop and develop and develop. That's such a good, refreshing thing to hear because so many times you don't hear enough people in our world talk about how they're just continually just developing and making shit and coming up with stuff. Because if you don't, A, you, you won't stay sharp, B, you won't stay sane, and C, you won't have anything the next time your phone rings. That's right. Yeah, that's all of that wrapped up into one, yeah. <laughs> I would also say that the, uh, I, I would say like a, a huge piece of advice for anybody that's writing something and that is going to, turn it in to somebody who's interested in something or you're showing it to them for the first time, be prepared for notes, first of all, (laughs) because everyone's got a fucking opinion. And like, you know what? What if this character on page 29 didn't say, you know, go over there? What if he said, come here? You know, and you're like, what? Mm -hmm. You know, it's good to keep an open mind that you're it is a collaboration it's gonna be a collaboration you're not gonna just walk on the set and go this is exactly what i wrote you know like it's going to <laughs> they're gonna come back at you. they're gonna come back at you because they also think they're creative as well and right. as much as they are not as much as they are not the ones sitting at home you know with a, you know a bottle of whiskey and you're just typing away that you know they're like they're, they're, you know, gimme, 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 gimme. And then they're like, but wait, I think that this should happen in this movie. And you're like, okay. So mm-hmm. be open-minded for that. Be ready for that. Don't fight it. Just go, oh, yeah, that's great. You know, especially if you're in, like, the first stages of meeting with someone. Like, if you're, like, it, like you know, a mid-level area there, you know, it's gonna, they want to give it to the next person. But they want to give it to the next person saying, but I fixed it a little bit. So now it's like our vision or whatever. And like, <laughs> now you're going to like it even more because I threw my two cents in there. And it's like, just go ahead and let them do that. Go ahead. Especially if you're just starting out. I mean, I just read a thing on, on Martin Scorsese that like, and this goes to what Andre was saying earlier. You think that because you're Martin Scorsese, like anything is just greenlit right away. It's like he's been trying to get projects made for years. You always hear stuff. Like, it's like, Mark Scorsese is going to make this. Mark Scorsese is going to make that. It's like, oh, well, he didn't do that one because they said no. But guess what? He had three more lined up. You know, Mm -hmm. he's like, but I have like all these things that I've been working on. So I think you have to be prepared a lot to to, for disappointment. Like you said, you're going to get a lot of you're going to get a lot of uh, yeses. And that yes leads to next week is a yes. And then maybe it's going to happen next week. Or I'm gonna give it to so and so next week, and you're like you're just kind of sitting there waiting. And while you're waiting, write something else. Mm-hmm. Have yeah. something else on the back burner. You know, always be. If you're a creative mind, and and this also goes back to what you were saying earlier, it's like, how do you keep it going with that with this much discouragement? 
the answer is if you are what you think you are, then you are. That's it. I'm a musician. Yeah. You can't take that away from me. That's I, right. I am a musician. And, and I'm not just because I'm not playing, you know, uh, the forum and I'm playing like a small club in San Francisco. Like that to me is I made it. I did it. I already did it. If That's I write right. a screenplay, it's like, here it is. I wrote it. Yeah. Is it going to be a movie? I hope so. Is it going to be a television show? I hope so. But I did it. You can't take that away from me. So That's right. Just, it exists. Just, you know, I, I think it was, I think it was, uh, was it Charles Murkowski? I think it was Charles Murkowski that said, you know what? Writers write. Mm -hmm. That's what you did. Yeah, that's it. And once Don't you're done, encouraged. once you're done, a thing exists that didn't exist before you made it exist. And no one, no one yeah. can ever take that away. Uh, and nobody can ever, you know, uh, nobody can ever devalue that. You know, you just have, no. but the thing about this industry, and I want to just take a quick second and, and, and throw a shout out to John Gunny McLaren, who uh, snuck away from the, the, the oil rig tonight to, to sneak a view. What's up, Gunny? I love you, brother. Um, you know, it's interesting because um, you, you have to write, you have to create, you have to do the next thing. You have to keep chasing it. You have to keep going after it, and you have to write. Um, you, you, you can't let bureau bureaucracy stop you from creating again. Um, it's just, it's not, this, part, it, it, that really can't be part of the creative process. Right. Like, I know, I know Stephen King's the biggest writer, novelist in the world, but you think he gets out of bed and, like, drags his feet to the, oh, I don't want to do it. You know, he's like, he's like, that's what he does. You know, he writes. You think yeah. uh, whoever, you know, any writer, Haruki Murakami wakes up, he runs like 10 miles, and then he comes home and he writes a book. You know, that's what you do. You don't worry about like, is this going to get made? Is this going to be a thing? Is this, It's just like, I wake up every morning and even if I write, it, uh, you know, interior house, night, and then like the character name, I wrote that day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that's you know, how I we're in a, you know, like, I did we're, something. I, I put we're something in a position down. now that's so much better for creatives and for writers. There are so many content outlets out there. You know, I mean, it is so it is so much easier these days to kind of will something into its proper slot in the universe than it ever has yeah. been. Um, you know, it really yeah, is well, it a kind of be, thing like where really it's more patience now you were like, right. than luck. Yeah, you, you had a screen and it was like. Great, ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox don't like it. That's the end. You're done. Right. Like now, it's like, well, I'm yeah. taking this to Bravo. I'm taking this to USA. I'm taking this to Fox. I'm taking FX. I'm taking this to name them. Just keep naming them. There's there's ones you've never heard of where where shows do well. Mm -hmm. Even this this new channel, Epics, which is great. They mm -hmm. they make amazing content. And I'll tell yep. someone, have you ever watched uh, Perpetual Grace Limited? They'll be like, what's that? They're like only the greatest show uh, in the last like five years, only lasted one season. But uh, they're like, where do you find it? I'm like, it's on Epics. I don't know. Go find it somewhere. It's yeah. really great. So yeah. you know, people are making things all over the place. I don't know. So I think there's some downsides to that a little bit. Like there is a bit of lo getting lost in the shuffle, and like you know, there, there's like a guy in Iowa in his basement like writing screenplays and, and thinking he's gonna like make it without. You know, and he probably will over me. You know, <laughs> I I <laughs> think it's it um I, it. you know I think it's just at a point now where <laughs> it's all kind of finding its new home and its new groove and its new niche. This stuff takes a while. You know, audiences like to feel like they they discovered their content. Um, you know, audiences are looking for more and more genuine and authentic content from creators. Um, you know, I think. Uh, I think it's just going to take a little bit of time for for it to all kind of settle in and settle down, and then I think it's going to be like um, like this this industry back in the '80s and the '90s was fucking crazy. You'd go to dinner and leave with a check to make a movie, right? Uh -huh. um, I think it's there's going to be a new version of that. Um, I don't really know what that looks like yet, but I feel like it's coming um, with all the streamers and everything. That's where I'm at. Well, there's also, there's also I mean, another change in this business is, um, you know, there's a 
there's a sensitivity issue that happens and uh you know throughout the years it's a wonderful thing that's happening um it's just that projects are being greenlit based on the fact that everybody is going to be included in the world every race every type of person everything and like you know like the oscars are now changed where like every film in like the best picture category has to have this criteria to it mm-hmm. they have to have a certain amount of uh you know but see the indie world the the indie world has oh, been fuck. inclusive like that since the 60s so exactly. like right. <laughs> you know right um That's what I you, said you know I'm like when did not when, when so yeah, so these are there. these are the reasons. These are just more reasons that we love doing what we do out here on the fringes of uh, of right. how the rest of the the industry seems to do it. Um, we don't right. give a fuck. We just want to I mean, make it's our just art. Like, it's just that in the industry, it's now on paper is the problem. We it's we like, just now we now just don't like, we don't like we I, don't give a fuck. We just want to make our art. Like that's literally what I it comes down shit. to. And um, but it's a, there's a thing where so if you're if you're like you could be the best actor for the part, but um, oh, we don't have enough, you know, there's not enough, uh, ethnicity in this, in this, uh, script, in, the, in this thing. So yeah, Ryan was great for it, but we're going to go with this person because dot, dot, dot. It's like, oh, so you're not going to go with the best. I've watched stuff that I've gotten. I'm like, yeah, he was fine. This guy was great, but they went with him, you know, because of a certain reason. And that's an interesting thing. You know, when you think about it, 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 it it's not, it, that's, something's changed in the business where, at the high end, it, like the big time business, you know, indies, indie, indie, we can do whatever we want down here. I don't yeah, know. stick with uh, us, man. Fuck it, we just yeah, want to no, make no, art. I'm with you, man. I, that's why we were talking earlier, like, you gotta make your own shit. You gotta make your own shit. JJ Phillips says, we don't give a fuck. We just want to make our art is something I want on a t-shirt. We can make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I think it's, it's two great points. And right now, you know, we were talking about creatives and, and, and trying to get your stuff done and, and, and either, you know, going through that, you know, process. But, you know, if you're an actual f- you know, if you want to be a filmmaker, or you've done some other stuff. You can't sit around and wait. Like Ryan said, go out, go out and make something. And we're at the currently as of today, the the proliferation of technology to help you do that has never been as easily accessible as it is right now. And most of it's free. I mean, if you were a filmmaker, like if you have a script and you want to make this movie and you want to you want to pitch it, and like you're trying to detach yourself as a director. Which, trust me, if you ever get your movie sold and they say you're not the director, just still get the movie made. Don't worry about it. Um, go out and shoot shorts. Go make little sketches. Go do something. Learn how it's done. Because you, it's not just for you anymore. Like with your, you know, a box of VHS tapes and you got to invite your buddies over to watch it and plug it into the VCR. You can upload this shit to your own channel. You can upload it to Vimeo and YouTube and mm-hmm. other people can see this. And here's what a lot of people don't get is you've got to put as much stuff up there as you can. So when you do get in that room, they can go, well, have you made anything? Mm-hmm. And you go, oh, here, here's my link. Go watch this channel. This is a, you know, a super cut of you know, some cool stuff that we did last year. Uh, uh, you know, And that fourth thing's a little old, but it was funny, so I kept it in there. And that means you're cranking out stuff and being creative. And s- something in there may catch. And be like, yeah. hey, you know, remember those videos we saw from that guy, Ryan Lambert? you know, about six weeks ago, like, let's give him a call. Cause like this project's really cool. And if you're not in someone's mind, you're never going to get the call. Or you're never going to get thought of and just go make stuff. It doesn't have to be big budget. It doesn't have to be studio quality. And all studio quality means is like, it sounds really great. And it has a lot of, an- you know, animated gadgets mm-hmm. go out and make something. Even if it's two people like Ryan and I sit around and talk about great two people scenes all the time of sitting in a, in a garage, or two people sitting in a car. You can do so much with that. Mm-hmm. Go park in your garage, put two people in a car, give a good little scene or two of dialogue, and move the camera around and, and work in, within that confined space and see how creative you can get and how much you can jam pack into a five or six minute short. And then post that shit on our Vimeo channel. That's right. That's absolutely, and that's phenomenal advice. And that's something that we talk about a lot here too. And you know, 
<laughs> you talk about the new camera systems and things I mentioned at the top of the show. Um, our, our own Terry Gerald, our, our own drone Jesus with the drone cav. Um, he's just gotten into this Insta360 camera, and these cameras are insane. And, and this company has like a camera that shoots 11K. Uh, I think it's called their Titan. It's it's like the like you, you know they're the already like shooting 11K <laughs> with these little like this 360 camera. This thing is stupid. The stuff you can do with it, you can put it in your pocket, and uh, and it's taking. When I watch when I watch like the demos and what what the company promotes largely, they promote like these little like uh, snaps and these Instagram videos and reels and things like that. But when I see tech like that, all I think about is the narrative applications of it. And I think about the fact that that camera could literally sit uh, as an ashtray in a cigar room and we could shoot a dialogue scene from the first, you know, from the true perspective of a fucking cigar ashtray for the first time in history. And that might be an interesting shot, right? Like, uh, you just have to constantly just be going and making and doing. And, uh, you know, but what's interesting to me (laughs) is because you guys were kids when you did uh, the Monster Squad, you know, that was like, um, that was old school process that they used to make that that was old school process and we preach that a lot here at the indie brigade too you know a lot of folks right like a lot of the newer filmmakers have no idea um what that true process is like and i think it's interesting because anybody who's truly seen behind the curtain at the actual process of how a larger budget film is made um it shows in their work uh, because you truly begin to, when you see how those departments all interact and work together and how the scheduling works and how this giant chaotic ballet is happening around you and everybody knows what they're doing. Um, yeah. That's the best know, definition. It's a giant, it's a giant chaotic ballet and it's all about scheduling. Mm-hmm. And I don't think a lot of people, you know, have that organizational skill or that, that timeline looking out, Hey, uh, why are you farting around? You have 20 minutes until lunch. You got to get this in because you can't come back from lunch and finish this and finish your day. Right. And people run into that all the time, all yep. the time. It's called making your day. And when you've scheduled out your day of days and your schedule and you're, you're like, we've got to get these. Now it's crazy. Like I've worked on movies. You know, one of my good friends is, is a producer and she she you know, she's ele- you know evolved into some bigger stuff. Um, and you know, she used to make a bunch of lifetime movies and there's a reason why they are what they are. Cause you're shooting, you know, a, a 350 or $400,000 feature in 15 days and you, you got to go and you got to make it. And if you don't make your day, you're not going back to that day. So you got to figure it out. And they're trying to make 13, 14, 15 pages a day. And you're doing the old school process. Like there may be three or four pages on the schedule in a day, depending mm-hmm. on what it is or how much the director wants to move the camera around or do this establishing shot. And I'm like three pages. Mm-hmm. And now they're trying to do 13, 14. Like people just don't get it. And oh, man, um, I did a movie I did, in, in 95. I worked on a pretty big budget movie and it was like I, I, we lost three days because the cinematographer didn't like the clouds. You know what I mean? He was oh, like, yeah, I, that, can't, yeah. I can't fucking shoot these today. What are we going to do? And, you know, and so yeah, they're like, well, we already shot out the covers. And uh, they're like, well, I guess we got a day off. We'll check the clouds tomorrow. And the cinematographer would walk out yeah. and be like, fuck that sky. He'd be like, I guess we're not working today either. You That's know? some Howard Hughes shit. When he'd be like, I need clouds. We're moving to we're moving to the Bay Area. They have clouds. <laughs> <laughs> for hell's angels that's a great story you know that's so fun. i mean i want to talk to you a little bit offline about the animation stuff because you know animation is something I've, I've been uh, super interested in and um i've got some animation stuff that's floating around out there too so i'd love to talk to you guys about your animation um well yeah. animation is always fun just because it's uh, there's no limit yeah i mean there's no limit to the man if you think of something you could do it it's not you know, with actual live photography and whatever, even with special effects or after effects, there's still some limitations. But, you know, if, if you want to have Ryan talking and all of a sudden his head opens up and like Saturn comes out of his face and then like a gargoyle like eats Saturn, like you can fucking do that. <laughs> yeah, you could do that in animation or with heavy, heavy drugs. So <laughs> well, that's why I mentioned that. I mean, I, I Ryan has said that has actually happened to him sometimes. So it was like, let's just animate that. <laughs> that's fine. Um, I'm learning, I'm learning the, uh, it's funny cause I'm doing these comics with heavy metal now 
and the rise is being told the original the the actual pristine story of the rise is being told over 13 issues through heavy metal and they're like eight to ten page issues within the magazine and so i went into it thinking god this is going to be so fucking limiting right it's going to be like eight pages of you know traditionally five panels a page it's going to be so it's going to be like fucking handcuffs what am how am i supposed to do this you know i need cameras and i need all this and then i realized like all those cameras are there to do is shoot the set decoration and the set design that is finite you know when a, with a comic in these panels i could literally write the craziest shit and then the artist this amazing artist i'm working with he just takes it and he's like what if i draw it like this and he sends it and, and it's it's insane the stuff that you can do <laughs> And, and and so uh, anyway, the animation stuff is really cool and huge. I'd love to talk to you guys about that. Some more. It's we funny, are we, were just um, chatting. we are coming earlier. up toward the end of the t our time here tonight, though. So what I'd like to oh, do is just let okay. you guys talk a little bit about what you have going on. Where everybody I think we're getting crossover you. or something. Something's not happening right with audio because I don't think George is here and Ryan at the same time. Oh no! Did I cut you off? Sorry. I just freaked out because I got a I got a uh, message from uh, someone I admire very much, an actress. I'm kind of like my heart's beating really fast right now. <laughs> uh, we were talking about self tapes earlier, and she just wrote me back about like her setup, her self tape setup, and sending me some links to things and to buy like a lav mic, this lav mic I want. You know, so sorry, I'm having a little bit of a a. a uh, Wow. He's fanboying. <laughs> Having a moment. Awesome. Yeah. One of my favorite actresses. Like, ooh. <laughs> so, that's, that's really cool. Exciting. Anyway, sorry. Bye. Awesome. Well, listen, Ryan, why don't we start with you? Tell us where people can find you, where they can check you out, and what uh, and, and, and how to get in touch with you. Or follow uh, you always, or do whatever. Always uh, uh, Instagram. It's uh, Ryan Lambert 111. Go follow me there. Um... I don't really do any other sort of social things uh, as far as like this world goes. Uh, uh, my band Kill Moi is going to release a new record soon. I promise. I know a lot of people have been asking for it for a while. Um, it's just a matter of mastering and artwork and things like that and getting it together. And uh, we're trying to find some, you know, distribution, online distribution. Um, other than that, I'm writing. I'm uh, watching a ton of content. I mean, probably more than anybody on the planet right now. Um, other than that, uh, you know, I'm learning to play the tin whistle, the Irish tin whistle. <laughs> where where can uh, your music be found? What's that? Where can your music be found? Uh, well, I, my old... The, the old records are sort of scattered all over the place. I believe they're still on Amazon, uh, Prime, I, you know, the Prime Music and stuff like that. Uh, SoundCloud, you can you can find uh, Kill Moi on SoundCloud, our last record, which is called uh, Hold Me, Motherfucker. Um, nice. This the new record is called No Seriously Hold Me, Motherfucker. Uh, so that'll be out soon. Uh, we're trying to get that out more more. You know, with the, with the distribution sort of uh, uh, deal, with, without having to put it out ourselves, <clears throat> so it actually has some more wide range, uh, you know, flow to it. But other than that, uh, I'm auditioning, uh, and uh, you know, who knows what's what, who knows what's coming up acting wise. We'll see. Bailiff, awesome. A bailiff soon. <laughs> bailiff. Well, thank you for coming on tonight, Ryan. Andre, what's uh, where can people find you, man? Oh, uh, you know, kind of the uh, the regular haunts. It's uh, at Andre Gower on Twitter. It's uh, at Andre Gower official on Instagram. And please follow uh, at the squad doc on uh, on both of those or go to the squad doc dot com and, you know, check out press press releases and, and updates and info and their social feeds on there. But you can read, you know, all the articles and um, you know, one of the things that uh, I'm kind of shamelessly out there doing this week is uh, I, 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 I try not to, I don't want to jinx it, but it, it's we're still 100 percent fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, which is pretty rad. And that's on the critic side. So we're celebrating that until, you know, some critic goes, oh, yeah, watch this. 
Um, but uh, <laughs> so as long as that train goes, that's pretty good. But our audience scores low because we don't have that many reviews on there. Like everybody's like, I love it. And I was like, well, then go to Rotten Tomatoes and write something like you like it or whether you don't like it. Just, you know, get just get more activity on uh, on the RT there. Uh, so that's that's this week's process or project is to get more people to go do some reviews on Rotten Tomatoes uh, if they've seen Wolfman's Got Nards. But uh, stay tuned on all those twi- uh, social media handles for uh, hopefully a really good update uh, you know, coming up uh, here about uh, international distribution uh, or access. Uh, and then um, there's a really cool event coming up that's uh, sometime in April at the Mahoning, Pennsylvania drive-in. They're going to do a double feature of Monster Squad and the dock at the drive-in in Pennsylvania. And uh, uh, it looks like I'm going to be making an appearance there. So that uh, awesome. that would be pretty cool. That is cool. That'd yeah. Be a lot of fun. Yeah, they, they, that group puts on some awesome events. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on tonight. And thank you guys for finally getting on the show and, and sitting down with me. And well, no, wait. Trying... Thank you for being on the show with them, George. That was the issue last time. <laughs> <laughs> You're mistaken. It's the, the world of me that you guys came back on, and uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation. So, yeah, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. Anytime, guys. Bye. Good night, guys. Man, that that was what a great awesome. Couple of guys. Great, I love those guys. Freaking phenomenal guys. Holy yeah. crap. Did you miss me, Joe? No. Yeah, I didn't miss you either. Fucker. No, you see, no, I thought this was Jason's show. Wow. Yeah, hey, hey, see, I didn't like see. Like I said, everybody always loves the new guy. <laughs> Until you find out, you know, the truth about the new guy, and then you all want the original guy back, and then, you know, maybe he doesn't come back, maybe. You know, uh, what, you mean this guy? <laughs> <laughs> well, see, he, he had plans tonight, so you, you, you may so want to do a little in thank Jason you thing tonight. <laughs> oh. Jason had to wash his hair tonight. <laughs> oh. Gunny, I'm so glad you made it. I, I hope you're staying safe out there, brother. Great internet. You know, I, I asked you to Randy. send Michael a link tonight. Um, you know, I did. But you, but you know, what's interesting is like, uh, I got a message. What's up, Brandy? Thank you for making it. I've been watching your show, checking and tuning in. Awesome to see you killing it. Um, thanks, man. It's nice to be back. So, so tell me the excuse about the professor. I'm sorry. Oh, he sends me a message like Monday, and it's just. Uh, you know, he still calls me Cameron because his grandfather didn't like that. He says, Cameron, uh, we need to talk. Uh, I'm, I'm working on something. But, you know, the little message preview pops up on my phone. It's just Michael Mandeville. We need to talk. I'm like, well, fuck. What did I do? I mean, this guy's like a kung fu motherfucker. You know, like I, I'm, I ain't trying to piss off the professor. You know, <laughs> but uh, so... <laughs> Turns out he, he like didn't even mean to say that. So uh, I don't know. He's he's crazy busy right now on some stuff. So I don't know if he's actually going to make it tonight. But um, it was a pretty great show. It was really nice to be back, everybody. Thank you so much for for having me back. Thank you for uh, for for everything that you guys do. And uh, we will be here forever, trying to continue doing what we do, so that we can help you figure out how to do what you do. Um, that's it. That's our big problem. I'm, I'm still debatable. We'll see. Who the hell am I kidding? What, what else do I have to do? Right. <laughs> we got David. Yeah. What? David. We have Is David David Madison. Is yeah. He He's, well, not yet. He's in the green room. I can bring him up here. Is David here? David. Hello. What's up, David? <laughs> How are you? I'm fine. You know, it was so great to see you again tonight, George. It's I, great I, to be I, seen, and it's I great to see you, you. too. I Those really enjoy awesome. your collar tonight. Uh, I'm Thank you. I got, the, I got the Arthur Fonzarelli thing going on. If you remember, <laughs> in the very first two seasons, he didn't have black on. He had like a like a tan thing going on. So Yeah. Oh, well, actually, it was brown, by the way. Was it really brown? Yeah. Oh, you're talking about his leather jacket or the thing he wore the first two seasons? The leather jacket was brown. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I saw it in the Smithsonian. It's actually right next to Archie Bunker's chair. Nice. I gotta go see that. How? Uh, how? Uh, I, I would geek out on that. David, I guess I like the sound of that. I sound like I. How have you be been, great. David? I am fine. <laughs> I am uh, losing my mind up here in snow-covered Northeast Pennsylvania. Uh, You're still my, covered with snow up there. Yes, we uh, probably have no exaggeration. Probably still about four feet on the ground, and. Uh, <clears throat> And it sucks because this is the time of year when my daughter's supposed to be out visiting colleges. But uh, she's got, uh, she just got her 19th scholarship today, uh, Loyola, which is a Patriot League school, and uh, I'm super excited. So we've got a bunch of stuff going on. Uh, so. Well, that's other than awesome. That da- other than that daddy business, yeah. So I have a question for you with all that snow. Have you, have you built an igloo? No, I haven't. Uh, I, I've hid in my house and cowered in the corner, pretty much, to be honest with you. You have to build at least one igloo fort. It's funny, because my, wa- uh, my daughter and I, actually, are like we're weasels. Instead of building a fort, we dig a hole, like, down, and then we put four sticks and a tablecloth over it. But because the snow is so deep, it's kind of like our own little like, house. It's pretty awesome. Uh, tonight on the end of the night and, uh, and, and I'm really excited to talk about this George because one of my favorite movies of all time is Ferris Bueller's Day Off mm. and my guest tonight on the end of the night Katie Barberi even though she had a very very small part in, in Ferris Bueller's Day Off it's hysterical and one of my and, and just one of my favorite scenes of the movie uh, it's uh, when the teacher's looking for Ferris and he's not in class and he's going Bueller Bueller <laughs> just a, a wonderful wonderful scene in that movie and uh, she was also in, I don't know, George, do you remember a show called It's Your Move? It was Jason Bateman. I do. Right oh, after. Uh, uh, yeah. Jason Bateman after he was doing the Silver Spoons thing. Right, right. Uh, right after. I think it even came on after uh, Silver Spoons. And it had the guy who was uh, David Garrison, who played the neighbor in, uh, in uh, Married with Children. He was the star. Karen Kay was the lead. And Jason Bateman. Uh, he, she was also on that show, and it's so amazing uh, that uh, she was involved in so many uh, uh, wonderful 80s, uh, the Garbage Pail Kids movie she was the star of, and, uh, and she's an international star. It's the first international star I've had on my show, so I'm very excited that Katie's coming on, and Uncle Scott's coming on, and all the same crazy shenanigans you've come to love from the end of the night, for the five people who actually stay up to watch my show. <laughs> I think it's more than five, David, and thank you so much for being here and being part of this. And uh, I know we're looking forward to seeing your show. Katie was super. I was the first time I met her back uh, in the green room. and But what a sweetheart. So I'm looking forward to your show tonight. Absolutely. You know, it's also really cool. I heard that Andre is doing the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, show at the drive-in. I'm actually a guest at that same show, so we'll get to see each other there. It's pretty cool. Oh, nice. Yep, uh, the uh, drive-in, that's actually here in Pennsylvania. The Mahoning Drive-In, they're showing, uh, I think they're showing like five or six horror movies that night. And one of them is uh, is uh, The Monster Squad, so I guess that's why he's coming out. Yeah, boom. And then uh, the, he said it's going to be a double feature, The Monster Squad and then his doc. Oh, sweet. Okay, so then maybe it's a yeah. different thing, because what I'm thinking of, it's all horror movies that start oh, like yeah. from... Yeah, he so specifically the, said it was this the, the doc, double feature. Okay. Of that. Mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. So maybe so. he's not going to be. So I apologize. Maybe he's not going to be there the night I am. But it gives you an opportunity to go there anyway. Well, there you yeah. go. Boom. Well, David, I went thank there you last again. year when we saw Good to see you. the Lost Boys. All right. I'll let you. I'll stop with my stupidity. Uh, not at all. I love you, George. Be well, and uh, I will catch up with everybody at the top of the hour. Love you too, we'll David. And I'm not feeling booed. It's me waving goodbye. Uh, <laughs> Dude. Uh, uh. <laughs> Good Lord. Uh, Jason, if you're going to, you were talking about that. If you're going to do it, do it now, brother. Or forever hold your peace. I wish because, I had like Jeopardy theme music, although we'd probably get flagged. Right? Stop it. You can't. No, no, no. <laughs> Copyright infringement. Uh,. So I am looking for something, and let me see if I can find it. And just hey, because did you ever get an email about that? Let's just do some business for a second. See if Jason pops up. Okay. Um, did you get that email back about that other thing? 
I, I did, but it still has the wrong date on it. Does it? Yeah, unfortunately, it says the 6th of March. No, I got one that says it's fixed, and it should be what? Tomorrow. Uh, you got an additional one? Because the last one I got was an updated one, but it still had March 6th. No, this is uh, apparently it's been corrected, so let me check the calendar. Excuse us, everybody. We're just going to do some business right there. Yeah, right. Because I mean, you're talking about tomorrow, right? We're supposed to be yeah, doing this? Yeah. Okay. My calendar's not updating also, so that's lovely. Um, oh. The <laughs> Behind <laughs> the scenes, ladies and gentlemen, at yeah, 9 this is how 35 goes down. 9.35 oh, yeah. p.m. Eastern, it says Saturday, March 6th. Yeah, there it is. Huh. Yeah. All right, well, we'll get to the bottom of it, and then, uh, let's see. Yeah, well, it's been updated, but it's still wrong. Huh. Uh, the Invitation wrong date. Two. That was my bad. All right, I'll have to send him another email. All right. Okay, so I, I got somebody to bring up that, you know, did us a couple of favors, and uh, I'll give him a second to fix his hair. He looks weird without a beard. I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> What's up, man? Hey, kids. Check out this internet. <laughs> Look at all of this. Look internet. at that. Look at all your internetery going on. What are you it's like, just, 56K? It's just everywhere. It's wow. it's 11K. It's 11K, like the new Insta. Wow. Yeah. That's some hardcore shit, dude. That's going to get you through the pocket. No, I'm impressed. I'm in, uh, all, all, all the internet tubes are pointing in your favor. They're all firing. Yeah. They're, I, we had lightning today, so I captured some of that, so that was good. Nice, nice. Put that shit in the bottle. That'll power your internet for days. How are you, man? Thank you for coming on and doing us a solid. Again. Uh, <laughs> well, no, I, I, I know now not to answer calls from Joe between like 8 and 9 on a Friday. Yeah, that was like 8.48 and we were going on at 9 o'clock. <laughs> well, no, and, and I, had a, I, had, I had the big old fuck all beard. I was just like, I, I like I'm going to cut my beard and see what the fuck my face looks like. And then I'm like, oh, shit, that's right. Um, and I, I was in mid like Teen Wolf. Like it looked like a sickly Teen Wolf. Like it was like it, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> Like, we were gonna I, call him Patch. Yeah, like I, Amish kid went horribly <laughs> prepubescently awry. Um, and then he's like, "Hey, do you want to do this?" He's like, "What are you doing in eight minutes? <laughs> Washing this shit off my face and getting in front of a computer? I don't know, Joe. What's going on, um, George? I sounded like a, a like a sixteen year old girl going. What are you doing, Jason? What you doing? <laughs> But it was cool. he waited until after eight when the rates went down because we're that old that we remember what that means. <laughs> Do you believe how old Joe is, by the way? I don't. I it's don't. Fucked um, up. It, 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 de it, defies, it defies numerals, Roman or what have you. I mean, all I of know. them. Like, I, know. I mean, despite the fact that we're both actually older than Joe, he's still such a fucking old man it's not well, i know but i mean but if, if you use a metric system then it's cool that's true that's true I remember, I mean, calendar well no i mean we we're there in the 80s it was like they're like the metric system's coming and we're like oh shit and they were like who killed jr and then like they never got back on track again it was just like <laughs> tell, that, tell that to my socket set <laughs> Yeah, I was like, "What do I, I? I do I do some metric stuff you in the wood shop, and I set, and I use some metric stuff in the kitchen, but um, but yeah, for the most part." Yeah, I haven't got my uh, welcome to the Indie Brigade food prep meal delivery. I told you they come. It comes in standard number ten envelopes. A lot of times, yeah. the envelopes don't hold up. Oh, okay. No, yeah, no. I mean, I mean, a tracking number might help. I mail a lot of I mail a lot of soups. A tracking. Yeah. Tra <laughs> <laughs> and plus, you had bad weather in Carolina for a while, so. <laughs> yeah, but also it's mostly soup. Talking about like it was like there was like oh there's 37 minutes of an ice storm. Oh no, I grew up in Missouri, dude. That tweet that shit for breakfast there. Dude. I know, like, but see, we don't normally get it that bad here, and so I don't know what happened, man. I just yeah, know, everything it's gonna be was like frozen seventy-three solid. tomorrow. Like it, it was like we were on Hoth last week, and now we're in like a shitty area of somewhere. Now we're getting off. like all the flooding. They're like, "Hey, this good. The good news: the snow and the ice is gone." But now we're gonna have like uh, biblical floods for the next week. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> I know that's why I'm growing the hair and the beard back. I mean, I started. That's how I'm gonna. I don't have a job, so I'm just gonna start renting myself out to local churches like around Easter time and like. 
holidays and like I, they could wheel me in a big paper mache cross and flash pots and pyrotechnics and, and shit. <laughs> An extra guy liner. Got to have extra guy liner. I do. I'm rubbish at putting that shit on though. Like I'll just I'll, like I'll draw like like a one black line around my island and be like, I'm good. And it's like it, like I walk out of even my son's like, yeah. I'm like, then you do it, and then he does a better job because. And then you look like Gene Simmons. He's much much more talented than me. No, I don't look like Gene Simmons, Joe. Not at all. You're no, but he your puts eyes the, yeah, okay. Yeah. No, more like uh, yeah, uh, the guy they brought in like after Peter Chris, maybe like Eric Singer, I think. Like when they went without makeup, it's like, hey, that'll be a good idea. And then people saw what Gene Simmons looked like, and they're like, yeah, yes, in purple striped spandex. Yes, he was cool in that Tom Selleck movie, though. He made a badass fucking villain, like with the fucking robot spiders. Yes, he did get away or something like that. So we got to talk. We got to talk because you're you're bringing your own flavor to the Indie Brigade with your own show. This is something. <laughs> so watch this. You mean that drunken idea where I'm like, "Hey, you should do a thing," and then we've never Does formally it, um, talked about it, but it just right. seems. Right, but watch, thing. but watch what I'm doing right here. See, so this is happening. So now we're going to just talk about it live during a show because no, everybody, Jason's actually bringing a show to the Indie Brigade Network. And so, uh, Jason, why don't you tell us a little bit about what that show's going to be and go. <laughs> no, 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 no pressure. With I'm yeah, just fucking. <laughs> Can we give him a single on this? I was thinking about like maybe like the uh, the you know the Romero Pictures Indie Brigade Tape and Record Club. I don't know. Um, we'll 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 skew it some way. The pageant of the transmundane. Maybe we'll call it the Twenty Four Hour Electric Love Saloon. I honestly don't know which way the shit show is going to go. Um, but we're going to see whatever I can talk to these maniacs and and give it me. And you can clearly see the production budget that we're working on with our great studio here. It's it's massive. Han Solo with the clown nose yeah um and the welcome to great pumpkin uh the the three things we will never talk about on this show are politics religion the great pumpkin the third one's a lie um <laughs> but yeah i don't know uh we'll see what happens yeah last no week, it's gonna be fun and let's talk let's talk this weekend if you're around and and like actually hash it out and get it going okay yeah That'd be cool. and if not we'll do it next week and whatever or we, or we could just sit there and make fun of Joe for a while. I mean, yeah, or we could just pick a time and be like, hey, Joe, uh, you know, you could just turn the tables on Joe and be like, hey, Joe, George and I talked and my show's on in 10 minutes. I need you. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> Put on your pants and jacket and let's go. You know? <laughs> pants are optional. No, seriously, Jason, I want to thank you so much for stepping up and stepping in and being a part of the family, brother. I appreciate you, man. No, of course, of course. I mean, anything for the cause. And I mean, it, it, well, I mean, it, it helped. I mean, the past, like the two times you've asked me to do it, I mean, I had, there was, I've already, I had intimate relations, so to speak, with the people that were involved. Um, so, I mean, it, I mean, it was all over the pants stuff, but I mean, it was still, yeah, I mean, like I knew the people involved, so it was, nice. it made it, it made it, yeah, fun. Yeah, no, it went really great and you just killed it, man. So thank you very much. I killed a lot of brain cells because I tend to drink a lot of rum. It's like every time you put me on it, like, yeah, I sent you a thing. I'm like, and that, there's more rum involved. Do we get, do we do have sponsors for the show? Do we, do we, uh, we thought about that creative route? Rum. We do have a couple. Rum. <laughs> no rum sponsors. No rums. No. Mainly no vodka. Rums. We'll see what we can do. Vodka. <laughs> I like it. But no, it's cool. And so, yeah, thanks for letting me run amok with you guys. Yeah, man. All right, brother. Well, thank you, and thanks for popping on tonight. We're going to wrap it up here. Okay, I'll put pants back on now. Bye, right. guys. <laughs> See ya. Thanks. <laughs> oh, it was a pleasure. Yeah, he's a trip. I can't wait for his show to get off the ground, too. Uh, so. I'm just thinking of what the censors can do with him. Well, no, I'm kidding. It'd be fun. Just, yeah, okay. I missed you. Happy birthday, you old fucker. Huh? I haven't seen you since your birthday. Really? Has it been almost a month? Yeah. Damn. Yeah, so well, thank you. Birthday, you old fucker. I appreciate that. I'm yeah. still, what, four or five years younger than you? Oh, I had to go there. I'm sorry. I'm only a few days younger than Jason. Come though. up here. We'll so. have a little, little hike. Kumbaya? Out, hikes the other. Oh, I have no doubt. <laughs> I'll stay here, thanks. <laughs> Joe, I don't I pretend love to you. be a badass. Let's wrap this thing up and, uh, and get it. the fuck out of here. Uh, let me find the uh, the.
the thing to do the thing after you say the thing. What did one shepherd say to the other shepherd? Let's get the flock out of here. Best line in Lethal Web. You want to make like a tree and what? No? Get out of here. You got to say it. All right. Are you ready? I'm ready. Everybody, thank you so much. Thanks for being patient with me. Thanks for welcoming me back. Thanks for being here with me. And thank you for letting me spend some time with all of you tonight. Don't forget, you ain't in this shit alone. It ain't easy, but uh, it ain't just your fight. We're here for you. Uh, thanks again. And as always, fuck off till next time. Being indie means we buck a system that doesn't want us. To be a fringe filmmaker means we don't do it for them. We do it for ourselves. To be an outlaw on the fringe means we'll die before we fail. Be an outlaw.
Mr. Ridgely. Hello, Mr. Madison. You Unfortunately, I just, I just have to apologize. Clocks in the house have different times. Something happened. I'm a little off. Sorry. Don't worry. Nobody really cares. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a silly mood tonight, Joe. You have to forgive me ahead of time. No worries. I'm, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'm sorry you're feeling a little under the weather. I appreciate that, sir. Do you think there's any chance that you caught the big COVID-27? No, no way no. in hell. I don't leave the house very often due to, oh, family you're, things. You're but, so cool that it would jump from 19 all the way to 27. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, well, William, Libby, Sean, everybody. I hope you're well. And uh, William, you, you probably know Katie from... Uh, either uh, the Garbage Pail Kids movie or uh, Burn Notice or she had a great show on uh, Nickelodeon uh, called, uh, what was it, Every Which Way uh, or, I mean, there was just tons of stuff that she did. Hey, uh, Emmett at Haven for Heroes, anybody who's looking for comic books and toys, antique toys and baseball cards and such, check out Haven for Heroes in Port Jervis. Those guys are fantastic, and uh, I love uh, I love doing I love going to their uh, store all the time. Uh, so Joe, uh, I like this kid from. Yeah, I know she. I'm I'm right there with you, pal. Uh, uh, so Joe, over the course of the last week since the last show, I think the very next day. Uh, my daughter and I went to a rescue, and we got a pussycat. And uh, we, he's still untitled, an untitled pussycat. We don't know his name because, it like, that's something that's a big decision. You know, you got to, you know, feel the cat out, see what his personality's like. And we've been all over the map, so we're not sure. But, right? You got you, Go ahead. I still vote for Director Dave. Director Dave. I like it. I like it. I have or director own, Dave Cat. Dave Cat. <laughs> How about not Joe Cat? Yes. <laughs> well, let me say that my little furry pal, with him being a cat and all, he's in the doghouse tonight. Because in my uh, in my house, I have a curio cabinet that has all of my price. I have this weird fascination with depression glass. And it's glass that has uranium cooked into it. it. Hasn't been made in close to 100 years. You have to have a special light. Uh, name them bang. I like that, Matt. Uh, uh, it has a special. You need a special light to see it glow, and it's just the coolest stuff ever. I, now, I've seen that on Antiques Roadshow. Oh, yep. Now, now this. Now he didn't break any of my depression glass because he would be Mugu Guy Pan in the morning if he did. <laughs> but he jumped up on the top. And uh, and on the top of my curia, El Pussigato, I like that. Uh, <laughs> zing! Uh, <laughs> you'll sue me for copyright, Scott. Uh, <laughs> but on top of it, of, of my curio, I had, and it was now, I guess the show was shot in 1978. So it was over 42, hi Lance, it's over 42 years old, and I've had it since uh, I bought it at an auction a long time ago. It was sitting on top of this curio, and this goofball jumps all the way on top of this curio that has to be at least six foot six inches tall, and knocks down my original. Uh, this is was a prop from the original Battlestar Galactica. It was a Colonial Viper, and he and he and he knocked off he knocked off one of the wings. Uh... Now this was one of those pieces that would be. Uh, they would put it on a, a stance on the bottom, and they would shoot, uh, like, shots of it uh, against a black screen. It was totally different back then when they had, uh, it was really cool. It was a cool piece until the little schmuck broke it. But, uh, hello, Mr. I'll call it Mr. Shush. It would be funny if he, the damn cat never shuts up. He walks around, and he's meowing all the time. It's like, dude, just say what you got to say. And David, did you explain to said cat that he's not allowed to jump on this six foot t 
call Curio and not like, yes. touch your stuff? I have the very first cat who listens to orders, who understands, like, oh, sure, pal, I will jump on your Curio cabinet and, and break your Battlestar Galactica uh, prop. Okay. But, uh, so, so you hear my sarcastic point? Yes. <laughs> You know what? All, all for all the the uh, the grief that he has caused, he makes it up in being very lovable and just a, a nice. Yeah, cats don't care. He's like. And now you but, see the worst thing that my daughter's cat does is sit in my chair here and then go on my desk while you know we're we're still live occasionally and yeah. start pressing stuff which really annoys the crap out of me but anyway that's not what we're here for the greatest thing was joe i think it was maybe one of the first or second show oh no actually it was during defcon <laughs> and you stepped away from your camera for a minute and your cat was literally by the microphone like all right i'm taking this show over cat literally jumped right here was in front of the microphone and had an evil look like yes yeah, so someday i'll rule the world of course david got a hold of that picture and i'll never live it down never live it down David is evil. He's evil. You know what? Another thing that I'm super excited about, Joe, I think the hottest movie that everybody's talking about now. Hi, Randy. I hope you're well. I like, and I love your show. It's so awesome that you're doing it. And uh, and I'd be honored to be on it one day if you'd have me. Uh, uh, The the hottest thing everybody's talking about, I think, in pop culture right now, and they literally seem to be putting out trailers uh, every... uh, every five minutes for the new Kong versus Godzilla movie. Now, I'm a geek. I get it. I totally get it. I want to see the new Kong versus Godzilla movie. And with that being said, Joe, I'm going to talk about tonight for a few minutes uh, uh, iconic uh, monster films that everybody who watches the Romero Pictures Indie Brigade should seek out and see at least once in their lifetime. I'm sure you've seen every single one of these. The first one being the coup de grace of all kaiju movies, the, the, probably one of the most top five most important films in cinematic history, 1933's Miriam C. Cooper's original King Kong. And what makes uh, the original King Kong such a, a wonderful movie is that the stop motion animation special effects in this film for a movie that's now approaching... Uh, it's, I guess, 10 years short of being over 100 years old, uh, is, uh, were absolutely fantastic. And, uh, and uh, it, Joe, did you know that this was the first uh, major motion picture that had uh, uh, nudity in it? In the original version, which, are, which is very hard to find. In the original was it version, Islanders? What do you mean? The Islanders? No, it was the Islanders before King Kong. No, the Islanders from King Kong. Oh no, no, no! It was it was uh, uh, Fay Ray is uh, uh, is uh, bathing uh, in a uh, in a little creek underneath the waterfall, and in the original 1933 version, Kong delicately picks off her top, and she's topless. And that's, I don't know. That's the stuff I get out of King Kong. That's what's horrifying. One of the most <laughs> important and influential films in history, and I'm talking about how Kong plucked off her top. So uh, what the hell do I know? Another movie that, if uh, a lot of people don't know, that the 1933 original King Kong, uh, William uh, knows and he has. See, he knows what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, The original King Kong had a very, very wonderful but often overlooked uh, sequel called The Son of Kong. So when you you get uh, your hands on the original King Kong, Make sure you check out The Son of Kong 2. It, it's definitely worth watching. It's kind of a rehashing of the first movie, but they were able, uh, the special effects were certainly, you know, uh, better because it was several years after the original Kong. But uh, you got to see, uh, you got to check both King Kong and Son of Kong out together. Another movie, which I think is even better than King Kong, you know, when I was growing up, every Thanksgiving, for uh, I think like 40 or 50 years in New York City and WPIX Channel 11 they would show this movie every Thanksgiving and as a little boy I made sure I never missed it it was a film called they remade it with Bill Paxton I think in the 90s and uh, and uh, I can't think of that that blonde chick 
uh, Bill Paxton, and uh, it was a really good remake, but not even remotely as good as the original. Everybody, make sure you check out Mighty Joe Young. Really just a fantastic film. Uh, you know, uh, there's also a great scene where all the professional wrestlers of the day, and I guess this was the, the 1940s, like Primo Canero and everything, were on stage, and they challenge Mighty Joe Young to, uh, to a, a uh, tug-of-war. And it's just really one of the best uh, uh, films of that generation. <laughs> Ken is agreeing with you. If you talk about Kong, Mighty Joe Young needs a mention. Yes, and uh, I'm right there with you, Ken. That's uh, that's the way to go. And one last one, more of a uh, more of a contemporary film. Uh, I think only made probably within the last 20 years, but really, really a creepy monster movie was uh, Victor Salva's Jeepers Creepers. If you haven't seen Jeepers Creepers. Now, I know a lot of people have issue and well and totally well worth it with the, the director and the filmmaker of this movie. And if you don't want to see it for that reason, I'm with you 100%. But uh, it's really uh, a, a very uh, smart kind of contemporary monster movie. And I think they actually made uh, two sequels. The second one was unwatchable. The third one was even more unwatchable. But the first one was a really cool flick. And, uh, Which was the one in the school bus? That was two. Okay. Ah, uh, and well. every Thanksgiving, Mighty Joe Young, King Kong, March of the Wooden Soldiers, WPIX was awesome. You're 100% correct, Ed. Also, if you grew up with me, around, I think we're around, I might be a little bit older, but you probably remember, WPIX on, on Christmas Eve would play the Ugolog for 48 hours straight. It was just a fireplace with great Christmas songs on. So it was one of those things I remember when I was a kid. Was that Channel 7 or 11? 11. Seven was Eleven. ABC. Okay. Can you tell we're all New Yorkers? <laughs> yes, yes. People in in uh, in Montana are like what? What are they talking about? <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, that was all. By the way, Ed, I just want to tell you, I am super excited about your your new werewolf film, and uh, good luck with it. And if I can help you guys in any way, you know where to find me. Uh, with that being said. Uh, is our lovely first guest in Green Room. Got to elaborate a little more. I got a couple of people in the Green Room. Uh, well, it, it, there's our guest, and then there's our oh, okay. Malaka co-host. Okay, fair enough. I, I, I believe she's there. I, I would like for her to give me a thumbs up so I know that she's available to come on. Go ahead, dude. She's ready to rock and roll? Well, my guest tonight is literally an international star of film and of television, and uh, I got to speak to her a couple times in the last week, and it's just an incredibly sweet lady, and I can't wait to have her on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, Katie Barberi. Hey. Hey, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Is it all working? All of the above. Awesome. Awesome. First off, you have to welcome to our show. Thank you uh, it, so much. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. It's absolutely my pleasure. Uh, it, m let me just give you an idea. Our show is like that wonderful car wreck that you drive by on the highway that you just have to watch, but you feel guilty about it later. Uh, <laughs> tell me a little bit about that. I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping not to feel guilty about it. Hello, Lance. <laughs> How you doing? I'm hoping not to feel guilty about it. But th that said, no, the first thing that I want to talk about, because I want to, before anything else, before we get started on anything, I want to talk about David's daughter. Oh, thank you. I want to talk about your daughter because... Mm -hmm. David and I are new friends on Facebook, and I am not that. Thank you, Ken. Thank you so much for the welcome. I am not so self-involved that I don't actually read what is on other people's posts. I am interested. And your daughter, you have to be so unbelievably proud of her. I don't even know what to tell you. She has apparently qualified for quite a bit of scholarship help, and I'm wondering what she does and uh, you've got to be so proud. And I just wanted to congratulate you. I just wanted oh. to do that like right now. Thank you very much. I'm a gushing dad. Uh, yeah, I'll bet you little, are. To give you a little backstory about my daughter is when she was born in 2003, she was at the time 
the smallest baby to have survived. My wife had something called preeclampsia or help syndrome, and my daughter was, uh, I think, 13 ounces uh, when she was born. So literally like the size of a can of soda. The, the, I'm sorry, the smallest baby to have survived nationally that, or internationally? In, in world war, worldwide. At oh that my point, God. I don't think I don't think that's the case anymore because it's now 18 years later. But in 2003, she was. And what was wow. so awesome about that is that she spent the first six months in the NICU, the neo uh, uh, natal intensive care union in Westchester Medical Center in upstate New York, wow. and uh, yeah, and all the doctors were telling me to be prepared to have like a profoundly disabled child, and that we were going to have all kinds of really major health issues. And mm -hmm. we're very, very proud now to say when we when we go to those reunions, say, yes, if you meant it by profoundly disabled, you mean like going to Harvard, Yale or, you know, Loyola, then you were, you guys nailed it on the head. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. So that kind of disabled, kind of, that that kind yeah. <laughs> of brilliant, unstoppable disabled is well, what she is. Hey, uh, Sean. She, how you doing? She was an enormous fan of yours, and she's uh, uh, she's going to be uh, jumping on rainbows when she sees this. Oh well, uh, I I can't I can't. Yeah, I mean, I just saw. On fa I'm not going to say a number because I don't know if you like want all that. I, I don't know if that's for complete public consumption, but not a lot of people can get those kind of scholarships. That speaks you know, of what she is capable of, and I think it's extraordinary. Astronomical. Yeah, yeah. you know, but when Absurd. you really think I was like, about wait a minute, I'm seeing it wrong. I, th I was seeing it wrong. I'm seeing the number wrong. And no, no, but you know what's actually really horrifying? Because when you really think about it, uh, a scholarship for a four-year college right now uh -huh. is between one hundred and twenty, one hundred and twenty-five, and one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Because it's not based on a one year; it's based on four years. Correct. So, I mean, you know, when you start getting eighteen, nineteen, twenty scholarships, the numbers start like it, it adds up quicker than you would think. But yeah, you know, that's I, I, that's incredible. Hey, Brandy, how you doing? Uh, so thank you so much for bringing that up. And I really no, no, no. Your, On the yeah. contrary, I just I'm 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 proud of her for you, and I just <laughs> wanted to call that out. I mean, that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about. Uh, first off, I was uh, looking at your career, and some of the things that you were yeah. involved with uh, make me giddy because it's some of my favorite stuff. <laughs> tell me a little bit. Tell me a little bit about when uh, when you were a young girl, maybe in high school or, or, mm -hmm. or just starting out. What led you to a passion of uh, becoming an actress? So my mother was a singer actress. Um, and I was very much raised in that world. Uh, I, I think I'm maybe the only six year old that got a copy of the best little whorehouse soundtrack for Christmas. Uh, probably not a lot of six year olds can say that or would want to, but 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 you know, I did. Um, and my mom was a musical theater uh, actress and singer, most, mostly theater and opera. Um, and that was uh, kind of the world that I, that, I, that I grew up in. My parents ended their marriage very early on. And uh, they were trying to give it a, a, another go. My father is, well, may he rest in peace. He's no longer with us. But um, he was Mexican and uh, his whole family is, is Mexican. And I was born in Mexico. And when they, they wanted to give it another shot when I was four years old, I think, the marriage broke up when I was three. And so my dad was, uh, he, he was a very important hotel administrator in Mexico, actually. He's responsible for uh, the, his specialty was building hotels and then running them for about a year and then he'd move on. And he worked with Western International, which eventually became Weston and El Presidente and Hyatt. And he worked with some really, really uh, good chains. And he built the original Weston Hotel. At the time, it was called Western International, that company, but it's now the Weston. He built it in Cancun when there were maybe five hotels on that beach. And it, the, the, it's still there. It's white and it's a Weston. It looks like a pyramid and it's a really famous hotel. Anyway, my dad built that hotel. And uh, so he was building it and he said, come down to Mexico City and we'll give this another try uh, to my mother. And my mother could barely speak Spanish. She had a very, very thick gringa accent. She is from here. She's from, um, she's from Illinois. She's from Lewiston, Illinois, my mother. Can you get more gringa than that? I mean, please. 
And so she goes down to Mexico City and, you know, tries to figure out what to do with her time. And she couldn't work in television or do commercials or anything like that if they needed her to speak because, you know, there was absolutely no way uh, that she was going to be able to do that. But she auditioned for the chorus of The Sound of Music. And she could do that. She could be one because that was singing. She could be one of the nuns and then one of the uh, party goers at the Bon Trap party. That's all she had to do. And when I got there, I thought, well, I, um, you know, th there was this role for this little girl and I could see a little girl rehearsing on stage. And I said, well, why isn't that me? And it was a part of Gretel and I was four and a half. And they thought I was really cute and really um, um, driven and ambitious and annoying. But they said, we, we cannot cast you in this role because we only have little girls that are eight years and up because, and they were right. I mean, you could literally, you know, got a four year old on stage, you could just get up and walk out at some point. So there were two little girls uh, playing that part of Gretel. And this was a really, really huge project um, in, in, in Mexico, the sound of music, they called it La, Noticia, La Novicia Rebelde. And they bring Broadway projects down, they buy the rights, they bring them down and they do exactly the same production with the same, you know, it's, obviously it's a different budget just because things cost less. It's just a different way of economy, but um, but it, but it's the same splendor. And they had these really famous actors in Mexico in this project. And there were two little girls playing the part of Gretel because they didn't want to saturate these little girls with these performances. And so I would sneak out of my mother's dressing room and go and put on the uh, wardrobe for the other Gretel that wasn't performing. And I would stand in the wings and do the numbers, do the, the, the musical numbers and, you know, do her lines and whatever. So that maybe I couldn't be on stage, but I felt like the applause was for me and I wanted to be a part of it that badly. And my mother really couldn't talk me out of it. Uh, so shortly after that, we were in the United States and we saw the road show for Annie. And I think I was 10 at that time. And shortly after that, I said to my mom, this is what I want to do. And we went to L.A. and I started working when I was 12. Sweet. Now, when yeah. you were a kid, who were the actors or actresses uh, that uh, inspired you to do what you wound up doing? Um, you know, it's so funny because I, I, I follow so many of them now on Instagram. Uh, and I, I, I mean, I, I grew up I, I mean, I grew up idolizing you know, uh, Olivia Newton-John, Michelle Pfeiffer, Brooke Shields, Cher. Uh, uh, it's horrifying. I think we're like the exact, almost the exact same age because it's exactly like the same people. That, really? Uh, Shirley yeah. MacLaine. Even though uh, I and, look like I could, even though I look like I could be your dad. I, you really do not. not. <laughs> you do not. No, that's just lighting. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Joe. It's very kind of you. That's that's Thank my you. fiance. <laughs> Off my Christmas list. It's my fiance's lighting. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, let's see who else. I mean, as as I got older, my 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 taste for performers got uh, you know very refined, and I and I started exploring uh, other types of of uh, of entertainment. But as a kid, I was very much into musical theater and everything that that you know. If they made a, a film out of it, I was you know enthralled by those performers, Barbara Streisand, you know. Now, in 1985, you're just a little kid. And, yeah. Uh, you get I'm, on to... In 1985, I'm 13. Okay. I was 15. Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, uh, get involved with one of my favorite shows of all time. I had two favorite shows from the 80s, one called Sledgehammer, which was about a Dirty Harry ripoff show where a guy would talk to his gun. It was very silly. It was on against... It was on against Cosby, so very not very many people watched it. It was oh, on ABC. Oh, that was yeah. a problem. I have a horrible Cosby story. I'll tell you that one in a minute. Mine's okay. awful. And, Go ahead. But And my other favorite show was uh, a show called It's Your Move with Jason Bateman, where he was one of the funniest, most sarcastic, but him and Karen Kay and David Garrison had such unbelievable screen uh, camaraderie. The show was fantastic, and I didn't even know this until I just looked up your, your resume tonight. You got to do an episode of that show. What can you tell me about that? So Jason Bateman in that role was what is known as the classic protagonist antagonist. <laughs> he was a protagonist of the show, but he was a cynic. 
he was a villain. He was, you know, in, in that way, in, in a comedic way. And Jason Bateman was one of my favorite actors by that. I was a huge fan of Jason Bateman. I, I, it was really good, Eleanor. Yeah. I agree with you 100%. I can't believe that show only lasted 13 episodes. I really, I can't believe it didn't last longer than that. And I think we were just in a time in the 80s where maybe it was hard to accept. Jason was ahead of his time. Jason has always been ahead of his time. He just now caught up to, you know, <laughs> everything that Jason Bateman can be. But he had started on, I think, I think, well, his dad, Ken, I took acting classes with his dad. And uh, he, he was already a pro by the time he did Little House on the Prairie. But he played the bad guy on, as such as it was, on Silver Spoons. He played Derek. And I think from there, they got the idea to do this series. Anyway, I, I had done, when I went to LA, I went already cast in a, in a play, which was lovely. I was doing uh, Lillian Hellman's Watch on the Rhine, and I played Babette in that play. It was actually a very serious play about uh, Jewish family hiding from, you know, during the Third Reich, hiding in their, in their parents' home. And uh, the first television project that I did was called Kids Incorporated. And that was, at the time, it was just this little show it was syndicated. And then it was picked up by, after that, it was picked up by the Disney Channel. But at the time, it was syndicated. And they had some, you know, mediocre, mediocre child, you know, performers on there, like Fergie and Mario Lopez and Martika and, you know, Shawnee Swell. So it's just people you'd never hear from again. Anyway, <laughs> I did that show. Uh, and then, I, I, I got to interrupt. Okay. W we had Ryan from Kids Incorporated on the show oh tonight. God, did you work with him? I, I did yeah, not. We had... I did not. I oh. worked with Jerry Sherrell. Ryan came on the show literally the following season, but I know Ryan. I know Ryan. We had Ryan, Ryan on Ryan. the show tonight. <laughs> now? Just now? Like, before? With George's show, yeah. Are you kidding me? Uh, well, we're yeah, on we, Facebook and we've stayed in touch, all of us, obviously. We were all 80s actors, kids together. And he started the show one season after I did. He replaced Jerry Shirell, who was one of the, the original, like, bigger kid. The oldest kid on the show was Jerry and then Ryan came in, kind of in place of that, of that role. But yeah, I remember. I remember when Ryan was on. Wow, what a coincidence! Sorry to interrupt, oh, guys, but oh, that no. was really cool. <laughs> oh, no, no, no! I mean, please interrupt all you want. We, Joe, we is, miss you when you leave. While you're here, Joe, <laughs> is our intrepid and beloved co-host in the green room and ready to pop on? Because I'd love to introduce Katie to our uh, Uncle Scott. I Mr. Have to, I, I have to prepare oh. my fiance for Uncle Scott's uh, uh, entrance onto this show because I think he's going to. I, I, he'll be all right. He'll be all right. He's just a little bit of a Kevin Smith fan. It's not. I mean, you know, it's minor. <laughs> Mr. Schiaffo, ladies and gentlemen. Hey! How you doing? Good. How are you, Katie? I'm good. What an honor. Oh, please. The honor's all mine. <laughs> uh, talking to David earlier, doing homework on your IMDb, and my head was just spinning. I, I, I can't get over the breadth. <laughs> Weird. It's a weird oh, no. IMDb page, isn't it? Um, but I've, man. I've always just been trying to pay the rent. Truly. <laughs> That's all I've been doing any way I can possibly do it in English and Spanish here in Mexico and South America and Miami, New York, LA. I'm available. I'm, I'm, I'm here all week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just, that's all I've been doing. I swear, learning another language in order to do because when I uh, when I went to Mexico to start, okay. So we were talking about a tour move. Anyway, I'll, I'll 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 get to that. But I did Kids Incorporated, and then we were trying to get me my SAG card. At the time, SAG and AFTRA were two different unions, and Deborah Rubenstein cast me in this role in a tour move. And there were three of us. There were three actresses on that week. Uh, one actress by the name of Heather Blodgett, who went on to do some things, and then another actress by the name of Shawnee Smith. And Shawnee Smith became oh, I love, I love her. quite massive, she became. And we played three girls that uh, that Jason's character was was trying to mack on and kept getting interrupted by, who was the guy that was trying to date his mom? David Garrison. David Garrison. Yes. And that week, they had... David Garrison and another two actors on the show, an African-American actor who was amazing. And, and oh, and Ernie Sabella. 
they did a version of Midnight Train to Georgia. And they had to do it for the show. I can't remember what, what the reason was that they had to perform. But when they went in to rehearse that show, that, that song uh, in, in the rehearsal hall, we were dying. I mean, there was no way that, that the laughter, we couldn't breathe. It was so brilliant. And that was my foray into, you know, primetime television and SAG was it's your move. Amazing. I mean, the, uh, just in the last, I guess, well, the last decade or so or more, the amount of television hours you've logged is just insane. I've seen like 86 episodes on this you know, 60 some odd episodes on that. It's just, my head was spinning. And, uh, well, you so know, what's, things. you know, what's interesting. I just, I just did an interview for a book, uh, yesterday, actually, I did an interview for a book for a director that directed me on a project in Mexico. And, uh, he was asking me, he said, so are you, are you going crazy just with this COVID thing and kind of being locked down and whatever? And I said, you know, it's interesting because when you're on that train, like the train that you're talking about, Scott, you kind of don't realize a train that you're, I, I didn't, you know, and I was working constantly. Sometimes I, I was working uh, two projects at once. Uh, in Miami, I was shooting a telenovela for Telemundo and then uh, Nickelodeon Latin American project at the same time. And I would leave one set and head to the other and then head back to the location and to the other location. It was absolutely insane. And that's how I have lived my life all of these years, and I was telling I was telling this uh, this author that's writing this book that I really I, I realized that I had come in contact with quite a few humans over <laughs> the last thirty years, thirty five years. It's been a lot of pop because every project that you get on, you know, there's a lot of people to deal with. They say that you know it's important to have talent in this business. I have seen that not necessarily be true in all cases, but okay. Uh, they say it's important. I'll take that and, as a compliment. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, and you should. <laughs> and they say uh, that you, you know, the work ethic is extremely important, of course, and I agree with that. But mostly it's that you're able to deal with the amount of people you deal with. And I have shot over 20 telenovelas. I've done, um, uh, between TV movies and, and films, I've done five or six. I've done uh, guest starring roles on, uh, I think, close to 20, between 15 and 20 series. I've done plays here in the United States, in Chicago, in Mexico, uh, toured all over Latin America. So you come in contact with a lot of humans and it's really important uh, to be able to deal with a lot of people. So. Um, I love people. I'm a total people person. I'm an Aquarius. I love, and I and I get attached to every family that is formed on every project. And the, you know, these telenovelas, some of them shoot six months. That would be the shortest shoot. Some of them, I, I've done shoots that have lasted a year and a half. So you know, a lot of drama can happen during that time, and kind of balancing that and keeping things, you know, cool and and always being respectful, and at the same time you know, garnering respect, uh, hopefully, and, and what have you. Um, the whole COVID thing of just kind of being able to chill for a little while and do some other stuff, write. I learned how to cook. Um, a series <laughs> of things that I had not slowed down this train in order to do in all these years. And for me, it's, it's actually been, you know, it's extremely unfortunate the reason why, uh, especially when we, when we think of the tragedy involved. But for me, um, it's, it's been a, a, a weird blessing in disguise, you know, to have the opportunity to chill out for a few minutes. I got to say, so. I, that's exactly what I thought. We are. Looked, we are. Over, looked over your body of work, and I, th I thought to myself, I said, this woman is finally getting a break because of COVID. Because <laughs> you, you just do nonstop. Or, yeah, not, it's nonstop. If you look at those... Uh, the television credits alone, that, I mean, the amount of hours you have on TV is staggering. But you started as a, a very young and, you know, some very cool movies right out of the gate. And then a bunch of very cool uh, series that you were steady on. And then you had a lot of cool one-offs. Wanted to ask you about Burn Notice, if you have any story oh. from Burn Notice. 
Oh, I have I have a story for burn notice. I have a story that my fiance will never forgive me for for burn notice. Um, he was actually auditioning for that episode. My my fiance is actor Craig Hurley, and uh, he he was auditioning for that episode. And I was scrolling down the list of characters uh, that were being auditioned for, and I there was a there was a role, and I called I called our agent because we had the same agent. And I said, can you put me up for this? And then I booked it and he didn't. <laughs> oh, that's gotta be tough. I, I, I yeah. didn't realize you had a fiance working closely in a sense, have the same agent. That Has that caused more problems than, uh, it seems like it could be a little problematic. You know, it. it I, in theory, it really could. Craig and I met when we were really young. Uh, we did an episode of Freddy's Nightmares uh, together, that, yeah. and yeah, and uh, and at the time I was uh, 16, 17, so I was jailbait, and he was twenty because he's older and always will be. Um, and he, <laughs> any time he walked in a room, I would lose my mind. I just sweat the adolescent sweat. He paid me absolutely no attention. Uh. Then over tw none, none, just ignored me. <laughs> Then over 20 years later, uh, he wrote a book called 27 and All Washed Up about this industry and what it can be like and what it was like in the 80s and 90s. And it was really interesting, uh, I think, brutally honest and, and funny look at the industry. And he hits me up on Facebook, of all places. And I, uh, I had just gotten out of a not a great relationship. I had been shooting in Colombia. And I had been in a relationship in Colombia with a guy and that did not work out well at all. And he hits me up on Facebook and I thought, oh my God, Craig Hurley, he's gonna be married, gay, something. Uh, and no, neither one, divorced, straight, uh, beautiful daughter, you know, uh, just kind of hanging out and, and doing his own thing. And he had written this book and he said, I wanted you to know that I wrote about you, but I wrote about you the way I always have felt about you, that you're a, a a great girl. And I wanted to know if you'd like me to send you a, a copy. And I was like, yeah, send it to me. Uh, and I, and so we started talking every day and then that's how we, we, we ended up getting together, but we would, we would like to think that we are a power couple in our own way. And if you, if everything, as long as everything stays in the family, like, you know, hopefully we're both working, but the important thing is that one of us is working. And, and if we celebrate each other's uh, victories and, and are there for each other's defeats uh, and the times that we have to kind of pick our, ourselves back up, um, then that's, uh, I think it, it, it could be problematic in a lot of cases and I could see that. But I think if, if you're approaching it from the right angle, it can be it can be really great to be in a relationship with a fellow actor because they do sure. understand us, I think, better than Absolutely. a lot of people do. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So. My life partner is a musician and an actress and you know, she gets me in a lot of, of course. Of and you know, uh, of course. We, we worked on an album together. It's how we met. And uh, so I can relate to what you're saying, but yeah. I, I did, I did think that I thought to myself, COVID gave this woman a chance to chill out because oh, of all God. the work. I mean, just a massive body of work. I, you know, so funny. started young and it was just bam, 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 bam. And just the TV hours alone. I mean, that's a lot of hard work. <laughs> well, thank you. Yes, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm sure. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm exhilarated, especially right now, hanging out with Mr. you guys. Ridgely. Yes. What's going on? Uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to Katie's fiance to spaz out a little more. So apparently, Scott. You know, he, he's a big fan of yours and Kev's, so we may have somebody else. David, please. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, one of my dearest and closest friends, Mr. Brian O'Halloran. Oh, hey. my God. I'm not even supposed to be here today. What? <laughs> Hi. Yeah. What is Holy going crap. on? <laughs> what a fantastic guest you have tonight. Thank you, Mr. Hi, Brian. How are you, Katie? I'm tripping. <laughs> uh, don't be tripping. Uh, you might have, uh, you might have you gotten so much for, for gracing us with your presence. I am oh, a huge no. fan. Yeah, and well, Craig, uh, but Craig's uh, Craig is not in the room right now, and that's a good thing because he would just be <laughs> moving my head out of the way. 
Well, then when he watches this on the replay, hey, Craig, good to see you. <laughs> oh, you. oh, man. Craig, you that's, rock. That's a huge thing. Thank you so much. Oh, not at all. It's lovely so, to see Katie, you. One question I wanted to ask you that I was super excited about when I saw, and I know you didn't have an enormous part, but you have a very memorable part in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And I love <laughs> that scene when you are staring at, uh, uh, can you refresh my memory what that teacher's name? He's something, he had something to do with po in politics later. In yeah. Life, right? yeah. Uh, I, oh God. Bueller, Bueller. Oh, yeah, he, had a, so, he had a, he had a, a he had a show. show. He, he had, had a, a show. reality show. He had ben, a show. Uh, I can look it up on Ben, a Ben, it's a Ben, ben something, Stein. right? Ben Stein's Money. Ben, Stein. ben, ben Stein's Stein. Money was the name of the show. You're going to like the story behind it even better. Ready? Here we go. So I was, I think I had just turned 14, and I was on the set with Christy Swanson's parents because we were going to lunch with Christy. Christy was a good friend of mine when we were kids. Uh, and we were going to lunch with Christy and I showed up with her parents and that's what we were doing. And I walked onto the set and they had just sent over the extras to work on this scene with Ben Stein and with Christy. Christy had a, a, a different part in it. She played some other, um, the, the, uh, he's sick. Uh, you know, that whole line that she did, the, my best friend's sister's boyfriend's brother's girlfriend. Anyway, that was her. <laughs> That was her role. And she had shot that a little bit earlier, but then they had to do pickups after lunch. And I saw the extras on the set. And John Hughes saw the extras on the set and freaked out because they were all somewhere between 25 and 30. And they looked, they looked like they were somewhere between 25 and 30. So he's ordering the guys to go shave and he's freaking out and he's talking to his first AD and I'm sidling up to him and I'm trying to get as close as I possibly can. And finally he turns to me and he's, I mean, it's very Hollywood and it seems like it couldn't be, but uh, this is the, these are the reasons why when you have an opportunity, you know, go for it. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, but you know, it might. And I, I, I kind of got as close to him as I could. And, and he said, are you an actress? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, what have you been in? And I said, it's your move with Jason Bateman. And by then I had done Silver Spoons and I had done, and I said, I've done theater. Uh, I did, you know, this play, Watch on the Rhine. And I was very young still. He said, how old are you? And I said, I'm 14. And he looked at his AD because uh, Christy was, oh, I should say this. Christy was emancipated. So she was legally 18. So they didn't need a set teacher on the set. They didn't have to, they could work her adult hours. And if they had me on the shoot, uh, they would actually have to call in a set teacher technically. But there was no way that was gonna happen. And it was just sort of very indie, on the fly filmmaking. And he turned to me and he said, you've seen Ben Stein shooting. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, if you had to, if you were playing a student and you had to react to him, what would you do? And I struck that pose and he said, don't move. <laughs> and he put the camera on me and he did the shot and they paid me, um, put it through payroll. And that's the shot right there. And I never <laughs> in a million years dreamed that I would end up in this movie. It just was not, under the right circumstances, it just, it, it seemed like there was no way that was going to happen. And then the shot ended up in the movie. And here's the thing. Um, I, 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 I was a SAG actress at the time. I would have liked to have done it differently. I would have liked to have had the opportunity to audition for Mr. Hughes, what have you. I didn't make any, you know, money in residuals. I wasn't in one of the, cre in the credits, nothing. It was just, it was very kind of, on the fly filmmaking, which had its own kind of, of really, you know, cool air to it anyway. But about 20 years later, DirecTV bought out scenes from 80s films. I don't know if you remember that they did that campaign and they bought out that scene and they contacted me and I don't even know how they knew it was me, but they paid me a rather large buyout to have me in the DirecTV commercial, dude. So oh, anyway. that's awesome, man. Yes. So thank you, Tom Hughes. Great respect to you. One of the greatest filmmakers ever, in my opinion. And that's still one of my favorite stories and one of my proudest moments. Maybe more than anything, 
uh, because I, I had the balls to try to do it, you know? So what I'm getting out of this story is you weren't even supposed to be there that day. Oh! <laughs> Not at all. I was there to have lunch with Christy. That's it. I hear you. I, Why? I totally now, believe in that theory. Now, okay. So is this an inside joke or did I just, are you saying that I oh, took no. 20 minutes your, to, to tell something husband, that I could have will love it because it's a line that's said in the movie Clerks again and again and again by my character. Recurring oh. theme, not supposed to be there that day. Oh, I'm not oh okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, right. yes, I get it. Right. Very nice. Very nice. Everybody I love the callback. Watching the show is laughing their ass off. <laughs> I love it. Not even supposed to be here today. She not even lie. supposed to be here today. That's what it was. A show that that I would sit and and religiously watch with my daughter on Nickelodeon every which way. Mm -hmm. Great show. It was a. Uh, 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 it was really. Oh God! Uh, there she is. Yeah. Tell In all her splendor. Of, <laughs> tell us a little bit about that character. As I recall, it was Ursula, correct? Yes, that yeah. was Ursula Van Pelt, formerly known as Ursula Roman. And I'm going to explain myself. Hap happily, I have really weird stories for all of the reasons why I was cast in anything, which is awesome. Um, at least it you know, makes for hopefully interesting chatter. But uh, they, they did a, a Nickelodeon Latin America series called Grachi, G-R-A-C-H-I. It was a really weird name. And uh, it was sort of a nickname as it turned out for, we didn't understand until we were a, a season in, there was a nickname for Graciela, which is the main character's name, was the protagonist who would have been Emma in every which way, that was the character. So I was called to play the mother, the kind of um, stuck up arrogant mother of the antagonist of the show. And this was in Spanish, this was for Latin America. It eventually sold everywhere. It sold to Europe, it sold to Latin America, it sold to Asia, it was crazy. The show was a phenomenon. And they contacted me and I'm pretty well known in the Latin market and they wanted a well-known adult actress to be on the show with all these young actors so that if the parents sat down with their kids to watch it, they would at least be able to recognize somebody. And, uh, and so they called me and they said, you know, we'd like you to do this role. But just know it's probably not going to last past season one. And I said, now, now, why is that? And they said, well, because the kids don't connect with the adult characters. And I thought, oh, oh let's not challenge me. Let's see what I can do here. And so I, I you know, I read the lines and I and I and I analyzed the character and I thought, well, she's it's kind of bitchy, but maybe she's bitchy and she doesn't realize why. So I channeled my gurus. I channeled Lisa Kudrow and I channeled uh, uh, Suzanne Summers and I channeled, channeled these great actresses that have played, you know, these dumb blondes on, well, Phoebe's the smartest woman in the room, always. I didn't mean to say that. It's just that she, you know, we, it took us time to learn that. But, you know, they're, they're actually much smarter than they would appear. And it's precisely because they see things in a different way. And I started channeling those characters and I gave Ursula a little voice like this and she would laugh like this. <laughs> And I started developing this character and she was a horrible human being, but she was funny. And I was <laughs> hell bent on making her really funny. And they started writing more and more for me. Anyway, I lasted all four seasons. I shot 225 episodes of that show. And then they sold it to the American market for Nickelodeon. So when they sold it to Nickelodeon, I mean, obviously, you know, all the kids on the show would have loved to have gone and 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 done the the English speaking version, but they were all too old by that time. They were, you know, 19, 20, whatever it was. And some of them have gone on to do really good series uh, in the American market. But I looked exactly the same and I auditioned for the part. Uh, they had me audition again for Ursula and the producer said, the producers from the Latin market said, you have to bring it way down for the version in English and we're going to have to really sell this and we want you to do it. And so we brought it down. We brought it down so far. I was bored when I saw my audition. I thought there is no way they're going to cast me, but then I, I got the job. And, uh, and so I got to play Ursula in every possible manifestation that the Western hemisphere would have her in. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, there's a gentleman named Craig Hurley watching. 
Yes. And he says, I am tripping watching this. This is awesome. Thank you guys so much. Aww. I think you probably know that, gentleman. Oh, there he is. He figured it out. He's like, where do I watch this? I'm like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you'll have to. I said, I have the private link. I, I don't know. But he, he apparently <laughs> found it. He apparently All right, found Greg. it. Greg. Yeah. I see that you work, got to work on Freddy's Nightmares. I mean, that show was awesome. It and, was. Uh, it was. And we were directed by the extraordinary and dearly departed, and uh, it's heartbreaking, John Lafia. Um. Yeah. So that was, uh, that, that was, that was tough to see him go last year. And I think, you know, as we talk about the whole, uh, everything and it, it, that, that has happened since this pandemic came on, uh, you know, we have to touch on the subject of, of mental health and, and, and how, uh, people have been affected in different ways and how loneliness has found kind of a new definition of its meaning, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, we'll never know why we lost John, but uh, I was up for that role with several actresses who uh, booked a lot over me, actually. And he saw something in me that, he, he, he saw that I looked crazy was his, uh, was his comment, which uh, I, I always chose to take as a compliment because she starts out a, a very sweet girl who wants to go to college and Craig's character is kind of a rebel without a clue and uh, wants to get, everybody always wanted to get out of Springwood in that show. And so he wants to fix up his hot rod. Alex was the name of his character. And he was total rebel without a car. That was it. That was it. And um, Craig played Alex and uh, he was, he was a, he was a dream boat and he, uh, he wanted to get out of town and take me with him. And I wanted to stay and go to college. And then the car uh, that he's fixing up the hot rod, he's underneath the car and it lands on his chest and it kills him. And so I go off to college and then I set all of my sorority sisters on fire. And, uh, you know, that's the end of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, now, just as people, as we do. Yes. As we do. As as around, here, around here, we call that a Tuesday. Uh, you did of a course. great, uh, you did a great, you did a great uh, little uh, cult classic film that I'd be remiss if I didn't touch with you on. The car, the garbage pail kids, with Mackenzie Aston, as I recall. Tell us a little bit about how you got involved with that film. So again, oh, uh, that was that was actually moments after uh, many many child child labor laws were violated. Um, and I'll, <laughs> I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, I was I was fifteen. I know I looked older, but I was fifteen when I shot that film. Mm -hmm. Again, interesting story. I was Mackenzie Aston's girlfriend. That was. That was my that was my uh, that that was my uh, personal life title, and he had just finished season uh, eight of Facts of Life, and he wanted to do a movie over the summer, and uh, they contacted him to do the Garbage Pail Kids movie, and uh, he mentioned um, in uh, in the in in meetings with the producer he mentioned that his girlfriend because they said we're looking for Tangerine. He said, well, my girlfriend's an actress. And, uh, and they, they tested me and I got the job over the likes of Trisha Lee Fisher and, and Jennifer Aniston and whatever. This is a loss that I'm sure they experience every day of their lives. Uh, <laughs> tremendous pain at having lost uh, that role. At the time we were raked over the coals. It ended my relationship with Mac. We, we, we didn't live through that because we were too young. Uh, and, and it was, it was, it was a tough, it, it was tough. You know, there were, there were adult um, uh, conservative groups trying to get the, the movie out of the theaters, disgusted by what their children were seeing. And all of a sudden Mac and I were just, were just texting about it the other day. And he, we put it never period goes period away, period. And it became a cult classic. It found its following. People love it now. Listen, the first experiment with animatronics was done on that film. I mean, that led to some really, really huge, you know, uh, uh, production uh, advances in, 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 uh, in special effects that, that were done. Um, you know, there were, there were seven little people and they had heads on them and it was a really just sort of elementary version of animatronics you had a bunch of guys underneath uh pieces of furniture moving these dials around and then their faces would move their eyes and their mouths and it was um 
it was experimental and uh and you know as i look back on the movie i i think it's it's funny in a lot of ways i it was not appropriate for children i absolutely 100 agree but i am glad you know that it has found its following and that people are as into it's kind of, you know what it is now is that um so many people are like into it in our age range they were like that was a movie i wasn't supposed to see <laughs> like that was a movie i was going to get in trouble if my parents found out i saw so i i'm, I'm glad to have that uh, that lasting impression that's awesome i see you recently shot an episode of chicago fire yeah that was amazing um yeah. I play the, uh, hopefully I'll play her again. We'll see what happens because they, uh, you know, obviously with, with production, production's interesting right now. The series they're trying to shoot with as few guest stars as they possibly can, you know, just try to stay as much with main cast as, as possible, just because, you know, the testing and the traveling and what have you. But uh, I play the CEO of, of the gas company in Chicago. And awesome. uh, that was that was fun. Yeah, the actors on there were amazing, and they were. I always, you know, I I mean, they're a huge NBC. They're a top NBC show, and mm -hmm. I was very surprised by how excited they were about my telenovela pass with Telemundo and my my credits there. And they they wanted to talk about that for hours, and I was like, really? Uh, <laughs> but they were they were awesome. They were so welcoming and and just really, um, you know, Iman is uh, he's a um, a, a really interesting and learned Shakespearean actor. And Jesse is just a sweetheart Australian who brings his ukulele on the set and he's uh, he's playing while everyone's rehearsing and lighting. I think that's how he relaxes. And uh, Taylor's really quiet. And it's a it's an inter it's an interesting cast. It really is. And they're they're pretty cool. It was it was an honor to do that. It's absolutely a terrific show. Yeah, it is. Um, with that being said, I want to thank you wholeheartedly. I could oh. actually sit here and talk with you all oh, night. Oh, I'm so, it's over <laughs> so fast. And I thought you guys were, I, you know, in COVID, I mean, we're in bed by seven. No. Uh, <laughs> but I, I thought, I'd no, this has been lovely. And uh, thank you so much. You are now officially a friend of the Indie Brigade. So that means oh, we're going to have... That means we're going to hound you for our Christmas parties and our Halloween parties and our St. Patrick's Yay! Day where, we're, where we all get drunk together parties. Awesome. But, uh, we're going to do that. I, I would imagine this year we're going to do that virtually, but yeah, I'll get my yes. beers. <laughs> I'll, Virtual I'll, drink I'll, cards. Yeah, absolutely. I'll get my beers ready now. That'll be great. Can you tell <laughs> everybody out there watching tonight where they can find you on social media, if you wish? Absolutely. Uh, on Instagram, I am at the real Katie Barberi. On Twitter, I'm at Katie Barberi. And I think on Facebook, my fan page is Katie Barberi, actress, actress. Absolutely fantastic having you. Thank you so much for joining Aww. us tonight. If you ever have uh, uh, Thank anything you, Lance. you want to promote or if you just want to stop by and say hello, our door is always open. Thank you for being so charming and sweet. Oh. You guys, Scott and Brian have anything? Oh, no. I mean, she's, like I said, you could talk for hours and hours. And uh, actually, I could talk to her about telenovelas myself because I had uh, <laughs> a lot of Dominican friends who watched oh, wow. the time. So, uh, well, and there was always... My, tell, tell them all I say, hola. And, uh, and, and they, yeah, the, the telenovela fans are the best, man. They're passionate. Yep. There was a lot of women. There was a lot of women slapping women on those shows. It was terrible. <laughs> oh my god! Okay, we have to get off. But I have to tell you something. Thirty seconds. I Please. was called. I was called to be the hostess for uh, Soap Weeks. Soap Week at uh, uh, Discovery Discover on Discovery Channel Soap Week. I was called out of nowhere, and I said, and it was all these huge soap stars that I'd grown up absolutely idolizing, and me. And I said, how did I get this gig? And they said. We compared on your YouTube slap video the amount of slaps compared to Susan Lucci, and you had more. <laughs> I believe that. Yeah, that's what I want to hear. I, I Let the work alone. <laughs> now, does this uh, absolutely get up my telenovela cred or what? It totally does. I am impressed. Thank you. And it's an honor. <laughs> Thank you so much to you guys for having me. Truly. Thank you, awesome Thank you for being you. so awesome. And uh, you're, you know, 
when when we do a talk show like this, to have somebody who is so unbelievably well versed and well spoken, and actually you ask them a question, and you get more than two or three word answers out of them. <laughs> it was absolutely a pleasure to have you on tonight. So well, thank be you well. So much. I will be in touch and uh, take care. All right, take care. Love to all of you guys. Be well, take and we'll, we'll see you for the St. Patrick's Day. I will absolutely send you an invitation. Thank you so cool. much. Cool. Take care. Bye. Bye. Wow. Wow. She's just, she's a bundle of energy. She's so awesome. You know, I, she's like the type when you're a filmmaker that you just want to work with her because you know that she's going to bring something to the set that's going to like uh, just make the day worth, you know, living. Right. But you got to watch your P's and Q's because otherwise you're getting slapped. <laughs> <laughs> Zing! Yes. They ain't going to take that from you. <laughs> so you the, gentlemen the amount of hours the amount, just the amount of hours i mean just man hours and tv hours she's logged just in the last decade blows yeah. my mind there's you know, probably I've, more hours of her on some sort of visual medium than yeah. her than her just sleeping <laughs> 62 episodes of this 82 episodes of that it's just like wow Oh, you know what I, I wanted to bring up with her, friend, but I forgot. You guys are all wrapped by Z. Is it ZSC? Oh yeah, you told me that earlier, and I, yeah. I when I checked her out on CSZ, and I didn't mention it either. Damn it! Yep. So, look at that. You guys are all one big happy family. So, you guys have had an amazing week, and this weekend is also got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, what's cooking? <laughs> Yeah, I noticed a new mic. Yeah, I switched up from the Heil just for a little bit. Uh, I'm now with the uh, the Shure 55, the classic. Um, I have like four of these when I had when I started the podcast for when we would be in person and everybody would have a mic. Uh, so I just switched it up because uh, the uh, Heil was very directional while this is omnidirectional and uh there's a lot of this of me talking on the side of it and still picks me up so that's the only reason why i switched it yeah this weekend is going to be a full weekend uh starting tomorrow uh we finish out with our good friends over there at wizard world entertainment myself scott schiaffo marilyn gigliotti the one and only jeff anderson uh, some of us will be doing one-on-one -on -one video chats with fans tomorrow and virtual photo ops uh, the rest will also be doing recorded messages, 8x10 signatures, and whatnot. And that's uh, all tomorrow. We have until 11 o'clock tonight Pacific time, which is 1 a.m. East Coast time, to get those orders in if you want to chat with me or Scott or Marilyn tomorrow. That's awesome. Uh, you know, last, funny, you... Okay. last week was mind-blowing. Uh, Brian, you mentioned it in your show that Jay and Bob popped in. A total surprise. Yeah. Uh, dropped some very cool nuggets about Clerks 3 and how everybody on that screen could very well be in Clerks 3. And I was Congratulations. just Congratulations. Like, so that was really. <laughs> it's, it's not in my purview to say who's in the show or not, but it was nice for him to, to drop that nugget. It was also fantastic to see during this week, he uh, highlighted the Chulies Gum Guy scene for a little yeah. uh, film film scene uh, recognition and uh, retrospective and uh, said incredibly wonderful things, of course, about your performance. And he also mentioned myself. Good to see Marilyn as well. It was a good way to, to encapsulate what this week was about going on with the Wizard Word folks, but really great words from the uh, chief hair director himself. You know what? That's unbelievably awesome. I can't wait till you guys get to start shooting Clerks 3. Uh, uh, that microphone, Brian. I remember you bought, I think, four of them at one time. Yep. And it was Scott was with us when we did that. I think it was some of our best work together. We did that podcast in Atlantic City. Yes. I think the, it was. Uh, didn't it was we Atlantic also do one in? Uh, didn't we do one in Sci Fi Valley too? Or no? Maybe I'm wrong. No, we that did was Atlantic City where we all did the. Uh, well, Atlantic the City was up in a hotel room. Right. And there was, a, I have that recorded, the audio for that. Like, that's that's something I may want to do is drop all the, because I had 13 episodes of just straight up audio podcasts of the show. Uh, there was a little uh, Corey Feldman story that we had that weekend. 
<laughs> Ed, Ed Kiever knows what I'm talking about. I know that. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think it was Ernie and Marilyn were with us too. So it was yep. actually, yeah, yep. that was a, it's a real a full room that night. I remember having a very funny story about an old lady in a, in an elevator that night. So yeah, <laughs> you know what I should do is I should bring everybody back on to the streamcast show <laughs> and just get the best clips of the audio show. And then uh, it'd be like a uh, classic cuts episode. <laughs> that would be absolutely fantastic. But well, just in such a short period of time, technology changed yet again. And now most pods are video and audio. Yeah. Whereas pods were more audio originally. Well, I mean, just the compression problem of having to compress all of this video at once and the infrastructure for bandwidth, people having the bandwidth to, to watch stuff like this, you know, that's, that's where the technology had a lag in it. So that's why podcasts were the first release of people spreading the word absolutely well gentlemen thank you so much for getting my back thank you for coming oh, on tonight uh thank you for popping on brian uh thank you uh, it was just great timing because that young lady's fiance was a big clark's fan and it was awesome for you to stop in and say hello i, w I was watching the show in the beginning and i said oh yeah that's awesome <laughs> as was andrew anderson he, he was genuinely shaken by the way I don't know if you picked up on that. I know I know Drew pretty well. Uh, he wasn't expecting that, and I think he was a little like it's Dante, <laughs> and he kind of was taken back. He's a sweetheart of a guy, but he gets really um, not nervous per se, but he has such reverence for the film that I don't think he ever expected to have you pop on. Well, that, was awesome. that was this awesome. This is a man who's thrown other human beings out of a ring, and he got nervous. <laughs> you know what's funny? I mean, uh, I've uh, I, I've done a lot of shows with both of you guys, and on many occasions, I've I've sat next to Brian, and people would come up and literally be so overwhelmed with emotion and and literally weep weeping to meet this schmo. I mean, this wonderful human being. And uh, it, it, all kidding aside, it was always very very touching to see how how uh, deeply your the film you guys made has t have touched so many people. So that's something really awesome that you guys get to have forever. It really is profound. And it's in England, there was a young man who was literally shaking and it's like, you, it's heartbreaking because you want his moment to be awesome. Mm -hmm. You don't want him to be upset and, you know, but they can't help it if they get overwrought with emotion. And it makes, it made me a little like nervous for the cat, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it went well, but when I saw that, that, that was one of the most extreme emotional reactions I had ever seen to our, to our, our mugs, somebody coming up to say hello, like visibly shaken. Uh, the truth I, of the matter is, is that uh, it, that's absolutely probably one of the, the nicest things they can do because it shows you just how overwhelmingly uh, receptive they are to meeting you. Usually when somebody comes up to my table shaking that, it's a jealous husband and I have to run behind the curtain. Um, or uh, they have low blood sugar and they just need a soda. Yes. Well, it's usually me. I'm the guy shaking with the low blood sugar. Brian's like, okay, somebody, somebody scoop Dave off the tile. Or they have a beef with the, with the cover art. Don't they have a beef with the Mr. Hush cover art? Oh my God! That's yeah, trick or treat. You stole trick or treat's cover. They have a beef like with everything, man. <laughs> uh, for, yes. every, for every supporter, there's five haters. So I got five haters. I'll look at it that way. It just inspires, it just inspires people to move on even further. To show to the haters, you can't stop me. Yes, and Brian has the best That's hand sanitizer. sanitizer. Yeah. Right. Always love my hand sanitizer. Everybody should love their hand sanitizer. Mr. Ridgely, are you around? Saving lives. I absolutely am. Like everybody else watching this show, drinking heavily to get through it. <laughs> well, you know, I, I thought it was interesting that uh, Brian actually brought up a great point. And for, for those watching right now, uh, 
he's bringing up his hand. He doesn't even know what point I'm bringing up. But no, I'm know. kidding. <laughs> um, you know, we've been doing these video podcasts. I personally have been doing it for three plus years now. And everybody started doing it during the pandemic. It, it was like a whole new thing. But there were those of us doing it years ago. And so, yeah, it, it, it's awesome. That's why you Sorry, were- I forget what point I was trying to bring up. I was just like, you know. Well, we were talking about bandwidth and the technology and people catching yes, up. Yes, ex- exactly. And three years ago when we were doing it, it was amazing that we actually got it done. It, that's the point I think I was trying to make. Thank you, Brian. I think it's the fever talking, Joe. I think you may be right. I, I told you I was under the weather earlier today and uh, I'm well, <laughs> delusional. Not- he must not be feeling well. We don't hear the air conditioning blowing through his mic. <laughs> I can turn it on. <laughs> the wind tunnel effect. By the way, how's, I'm how's gonna... it going over there, Joe? Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's I don't know what you're talking about. All this voice in my 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 voice. Oh, thank you, Eleanor. <laughs> I'm going to invite you, seeing you guys are all on the screen right Of course, Joe, you're. You, uh, well, if you guys would please join me next week because I'm going to have my version of Night of 100 Stars because it's my one year anniversary show. Oh, congratulations. So uh, next, uh, next Friday is exactly one year ago that we did uh, Daniel Roebuck on our first show. And uh, uh, I think we're probably going to go for a little bit over our hour next week because I have all kinds of crazy shenanigans planned and I'm sure there will be lots of people who want to come on and, and poke fun at me, especially Tiffany Shepis and her giant head. Right, because she's, gi- like, she's probably going to be like, thanks for reminding us we've been locked in our houses for a year. Having to watch you, Mr. Madison. Uh, with that being said, I don't want you to go, Joe, I don't want you to go close up tonight because uh, I look at this show as it doesn't happen unless all of us are working on it together because you guys are what makes it awesome for me. And uh, I'm going to say my line, and I want you three guys to say the, the, the end of it, and then we'll cut off because you'll know exep- exactly what to say. All right, you guys ready? Remember, no man is a failure. If he has friends... Thank you, Scott. At least one of you care enough to help me out and not make me look like a show. <laughs> I, I thought we were all taking parts of it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm trying not to get a seizure from Brian's background, so... Oh, follow me. It's who has friends. So let's try it one more time, okay? There, take two. Remember, no man is a failure. Who, who has friends like David Madison? Thank you, Joe. You're going to make me cry now. In a row? <laughs> <laughs> friends in a row. Now I have to go clean cat litter. Yay, me. What Yay, the me. fuck are you bitches babbling about? <laughs> well, damn it, I hit the button. It didn't work. What the hell's going on here? Oh, that's the a show wrong must button. Never- the show must never end. 